but I just wanted to welcome all of you who came in early here today and great to meet you and good morning, good evening as well. And, uh, <laughs> and we're almost okay. ready to go. <clears throat> okay, and I will go over to you and uh, welcome everyone. All right, hello everybody. And on behalf of all of us here behind the scenes today, welcome to this, to this event focused on new research in oral history, embodied stories, gender, the body and oral history. This event was organized by former lead co-director of CODE, Cynthia Hammond, professor in the Department of Art History here at Concordia University, who you'll hear from very shortly, and whom we at Force Space had the pleasure of working with to make the Summer Institute happen in this virtual way. For those of you wondering, what is Fourth Space? Well, welcome to our virtual channel. Fourth Space itself is located in downtown Jajage, Montreal on unceded indigenous land. You see it here in the Zoom space as one of the little video boxes. It's a university-wide platform that connects the public with the inner workings of Concordia <coughs> University by activating the various research projects, teaching and cross-disciplinary initiatives that are brewing across the university. So it's really our great pleasure to invite you into this space, albeit uh, virtually today. As you've already noticed, we are running proceedings as a meeting instead of a webinar so that you might have the opportunity to turn on your cameras as so many of you have done already um, and see one another, you know, connect in all the ways that Zoom allows for, which is still limited, but you do have audio, video and text options here. And as you'll also note, you'll have um, a chance to connect in a more casual way in breakout rooms. So we'll explain those a little bit later, but you will have a break coming up after the first presentations and you'll have either a coffee chat room where you can go and casually meet up with uh, your pals here, or you can go to a screening room and experience some great codes projects. Um, having said this uh, about kind of all the options that you have available to you, we do invite you to keep your microphones turned off during presentations and use the uh, hand raise feature during Q&A if you'd like to speak. Um, and of course, send your questions and comments via the chat at any point. Finally, I'll just note that we are recording and streaming the presentations to Facebook, um, but the view is set to active speaker view for the recording, so audience members will not be visible unless you turn on your camera and you speak. Um, that's the housekeeping done and dealt with on my end, and once again, welcome. Over to you, Cynthia. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Cynthia Hammond. And it's my great pleasure to wish you all welcome. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue to the 2021 CODES SOHC Summer Institute. So we are coming together today from different parts of the world, including Canada, Scotland, and the United States. And I want to begin by acknowledging that the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling, or CODES, and Concordia University are located on unceded Indigenous lands. And we at CODES recognize the Ganyangahaga Nation as the custodians of the lands and waters upon which we gather virtually today. Dojaga or Montreal has long been a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous, settler, immigrant, and refugee people. And speaking on behalf of myself and CODES, I want to express our respect for the longstanding indigenous presence in Montreal and our solidarity with decolonizing work of all kinds. So the 2021 Summer Institute is the third collaboration between CODES and the Scottish Oral History Centre, which is part of the University of Strathclyde, located in Glasgow, Scotland. I would like to warmly acknowledge Director Arthur McIver and the members of the Scottish Oral History Centre and thank them for their enthusiasm to hold this very special shared event, even during distance times. It's true we won't have the shared experience of the heat wave that marked the first Summer Institute, which took place here in Montreal in 2015. And sadly, we will not share the string of wonderful Glaswegian pubs that we enjoyed during the second Institute in Glasgow in 2018. But after the year we've just had, I still think it's pretty fabulous that in 2021, we nonetheless will have a shared event. <laughs> and I really thank Concordia's fourth space for support, supporting our work. Uh, so as Anna mentioned, the theme of this year's Institute is embodied stories, gender, the body and oral history. And as such, it uh, constitutes the pandemic delayed culminating event in CODE's 2019 
2020 public programming theme, which was listening on behalf of feminist futures. And so if I can sum up what we're doing for the next few days, uh, really we are providing a, a group or collective response to a central guiding question, which is how can oral history practices, including research creation, illuminate questions of gender and embodiment? So how it's going to work today and tomorrow is that you're going to hear 16 short papers by students, scholars and affiliates of CODES and SOHC. So that's June 7th and June 8th. And uh, as Anna mentioned during these two days of talks, there will be a breakout room available to you during the breaks, which will feature a continuous research creation playlist curated by CODES coordinator, Emma Harake. And there you'll be able to watch and listen to short works by myself, Iphigenie Marcou Fortier, Veronica Mockler, and Dr. Kathleen Vaughn, so all codes affiliates. And then on Wednesday, the format changes, and we'll be offering two fantastic workshops. The first is on mapping gendered stories, and this is offered by the Geomedia Lab, which is directed by the current, current codes lead co director, Dr. Sebastian Kakao. Then the second workshop, also on Monday, is offered by Professor Liz Miller and recent graduate Emilie Trudeau. And this will be on using virtual reality to explore feminist embodiment in colonial frameworks. So that's June 9th. Then on June 10th, there will be a live conversation between Dr. Luis Sotelo Castro and activist Julie Ann Carpini. And this will be on the theme of being heard, uh, survivor's journey uh, to being an activist. And you do need a separate sign up link for that particular conversation. And I am hopefully putting that into the chat right now, yes. In addition to all this, I'm so pleased to be able to share with you an asynchronous podcast on the 2021 Institute's theme. And you can watch this anytime and it will be available after the Institute also. And this features Dr. Bimadashka Pukang and Dr. Nancy R. Tapias Torado. And I'll put that link in the chat in just a few moments. So there will be also lots of opportunities to connect with each other outside all this exciting programming. So today there will be two 15 minute breaks. And yes, you can go see the research creation if you'd like to, but there will also be multiple breakout rooms that you can enter and enjoy smaller conversations because we know that sometimes it's hard to have a chat when it's you know 30 people on Zoom. Also at the end of today's uh, sessions and tomorrow's sessions, we'll have one hour of social time both days, totally unscripted, just to connect with each other, continue some of the conversations about each other's work and so on. So I really want to thank everyone who's made this event possible. Anna Vakovic, Doug Moffat of the Fourth Space, thank you. Emma Haraki and the CODES team, thank you. And to the artists and presenters who will soon be sharing their work with us, thank you so much. And to you, the audience who joins us today, I thank you also for providing something that, as my colleague Lewis points out, matters so much in research and art involving oral history. And that is the irreplaceable act of listening. So have a wonderful Summer Institute. I'm gonna see you the whole time. And our first moderator, Kelly, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Can everybody hear me? Wonderful. Yes. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the conference entitled The Embodiment of Books, Writing, and Literature, featuring presentations by Erin Jesse, Eleanor Bell, and Kate Wilson. So my name is Kelly Nora Drucker, and I'm a doctoral candidate in the Humanities Program at Concordia University also affiliated with CODES and the Center for Irish Studies, and I'll be moderating the session. So today we'll be hearing three papers of 10 minutes each, and following the final paper, we'll open up for a Q&A session that will last approximately half an hour. Um, you're welcome at any time to write your questions into the Zoom chat. Just be sure to name the person that you're addressing. And we'll try to answer as many of the questions as possible in the Q&A, although that perhaps that we won't have time for all of them, but we'll do our best. Um, I'd like to give a gentle reminder to everyone, except the person who is sharing their paper, to turn their mics off during the presentation. 
And to help keep our session within time, I'm going to be turning on my mic after the 10 minute mark of each paper. And then there'll be a two minute grace period in which the presenter can wrap up. Sound good? Great. Okay, so to welcome our first presenter, Erin Jesse. Erin Jesse is a Lord Kelvin Adam Smith Research Fellow in the Department of History at the University of Glasgow. She has over a decade of experience conducting qualitative fieldwork in Rwanda and is the author of Negotiating Genocide in Rwanda, The Politics of History, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2017. She has also published articles in such notable journals as Memory Studies, Conflict and Society, History in Africa, Oral History Re Review, and Forensic Science International, among others. Everyone, welcome Erin Jesse. Thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you to the organizers <laughs> so much for putting this together. I know how hard it is to organize these things online. I'm just so impressed by how well everything seems to be coming together so far. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, is everyone able to see this okay? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so for the purpose of my talk today, um, I'm going to be talking about an ongoing project um, that's titled Writing Women Back into Rwandan History, which I've been working on in collaboration um, with some people who I'll introduce you to in just a moment, um, since about 2016. And to give you a little bit of context for this project then, um, this is a project that is taking place um, in Rwanda, a small East African nation that is largely known to the outside world for the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, as it's referred to in official parlance. Um, and in addition, I mean, Rwanda also occasionally appears in the media, um, celebrated for the government's current efforts and ongoing efforts to promote gender equality um, throughout society, including governance um, in the post-genocide period. And often in talking about then, um, in particular, this issue of gender equality, it's typically presented in the media um, and in a lot of academic literature as well as a very sharp um, and important breakaway from pre-genocide Rwanda, which um, as Sarah Brown among others characterize it as having been sort of very much shaped by these deeply entrenched patriarchal systems in which Rwanda's women were hard pressed for a space to exercise agency. Um, but of course this raises the question, I mean, the way that this often comes up in the literature and the media and so on, um, it sort of presents it as though women's lives were always affected by these deeply patriarchal norms, you know, seemingly going back to time immemorial. Um, and as a historian who works in Rwanda, um, it actually, it seems to me, and it has seemed to be for quite a, quite a time now, that we really don't actually know that much about what Rwandan women's lives would have been like prior to 1994. Um, there have been a lot of really important historical studies on Rwanda over the years, particularly scholars like Alexis Kagame, Jan Van Sina, Andre Coupe and Thomas Kamanzi um, and others who have sort of conducted these in-depth studies of Rwanda's colonial period, um, Rwanda's what's called the Naginya Kingdom, which is the, the sort of monarchy that existed in the country prior to Rwandan independence in 1962. Um, but often within these studies, Rwandan women are really only mentioned in passing and where they do typically get a mention, um, it's often in their sort of capacity as queen mothers, these very sort of elite figures that would have been very central to, to court um, operations um, when the Nguyen Kingdom was, was, at, was at its height. There are a couple of notable exceptions to this. For example, um, historian Sarah Watkins has done an excellent study on intimates um, within the Rwandan monarchy, so not just queen mothers, but other kinds of women actors who are close to the court um, and who made significant contributions to it, the culture there, the history and so on, its development. Um, and likewise, anthropologist Helen Coderre has also produced a very, very significant study called a biography, a biography of an African society, um, in which she interviews Rwandan women from a range of backgrounds who were sort of living around um, Rwanda's cultural center, a town known as Butare at the time. Um, but these studies in themselves, as, as foundational as they are, are also quite limited. Watkins focuses primarily on elites um, or, or women who are very close to elites. And Coderre, for her part, is focusing really on one very tiny, tiny region um, within Rwanda, a small community within Rwanda. Um, we haven't really seen a kind of in-depth study across different regions, across different socioeconomic backgrounds and so on, of what gender norms in Rwanda and, and women's lives in particular might have looked like. Um, so with this in mind then, um, 
one of the goals of this project early on was to conduct an intensive study of Rwanda gender norms. Um, and in doing so then we were led by, you know, these really very brief but quite provocative statements that existed in the literature around what life would have been like for Rwandan women, broadly speaking. Um, and so the two quotes I put up here, one by Yanda Ansina, one from Gamaliel Mbonimana, um, sort of give you an idea of how women um, and the extent to which women were really talked about in these broader historical studies on the country. Um, so Vansina, for his part, recognizes that women's positions could be quite complex and variable, but often, you know, very much tied to the status of the men in their lives. And so, you know, any agent they might have really came through these male actors they were close to. Um, Bonimana, for his part, really talks about um, women's involvement in sort of the operation of the household and sort of the farmlands and so on immediately associated with um, maintaining the household, keeping the family fed and this kind of thing. And so there's a lot of emphasis in his, in his sort of summary of Rwandan women's lives um, and the way in which Rwandan what men and women would work together on like agriculture, maintaining the home, domestic duties and, and so on. Um, and so we sort of took these, these competing accounts or, or, or different accounts um, into consideration for a project that we launched in 2016. Um, and the sort of two main objectives of this project, first of all, was to kind of uncover Rwandan women's contributions to Rwandan history going back to the 16th century, which is really the time period where we start to come across um, quite substantive oral traditions about, you know, Rwandan men and women and how they interacted. Um, and then a second core objective was to try and make these stories accessible to Rwandans and other interested public um, audiences, because many of these stories are actually held in archives outside of Rwanda and are not widely accessible to Rwandans today. Um, and this project then was very much informed by a desire that would be, I suspect, quite common to many of the oral historians present here today, uh, a desire to democratize history in Rwanda, to amplify previously marginalized voices and experiences, um, and likewise do these really sort of rigorous historically informed studies of early Rwandan history and cultural heritage um, that simultaneously then brings these sources into conversation with the historiography that exists in English, French, and Kinyarwanda, which are the three official languages in Rwanda at present. Um, so I'd like to take a moment just to briefly introduce the research team and of course all images here are shared with their full permission. Um, so the folks that I'm working with on this project, um, first of all, Silver Muzerwa, um, a researcher who's worked with me now for a number of years um, on studies of Rwandan history. Also Jerome Aaron Hunda, um, a researcher I've really, we've only really begun working together in the last couple of years, um, but it is just a wealth of knowledge on Rwandan cultural heritage practices. Um, and then Christian Mafajiri, who's the artist who's doing all the illustrations um, for this project. Um, Mark Ellison, who's our digital media consultant, and indeed many of the photos that I'm showing here um, are taken by him. The, the nice looking ones are Mark's. Uh, the not so nice looking ones tend to be mine. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, all of this work is then being made possible by a formal partnership that we have with the Rwandan Cultural Heritage Academy um, and the Institute of National Museums of Rwanda. And so we're working, in addition to the research activities, we also do a lot of capacity strengthening activities with, um, with these two institutions in Rwanda to help train their own researchers and working with these kinds of materials. Um, in terms of the methodology then, um, we're working with archived oral traditions that have been documented um, in the early to mid 1900s, typically by European researchers, though not always. Um, and these are then materials that we're collecting from colonial archives that are based across Europe and North America. Um, and this focus on these colonial archives then is necessitated by the fact that in 1994, during the genocide, much of Rwanda's own holdings in terms of cultural heritage and history were actively destroyed as part of the genocide. Um, so that's why we're looking beyond Rwanda. Um, we're also then a second key component of this project is conducting new oral history interviews. Um, and we're emphasizing with these elders and other related experts who can speak to different aspects of Rwandan history and Rwandan cultural heritage um, as a result of the, the oral traditions that they've learned and, and been performing over the years. Um, this is a very collaborative project. Um, it's meant to also be very much active in terms of capacity strengthening with our partner organizations. Um, and as part of this, then, as I mentioned, we're actively working with them to develop um, codes of practice for oral historical research that are culturally and um, politically appropriate for Rwanda. Um, and we're also doing what we can as well to help them then publish the results of their own research um, and making sure it's accessible to, to broad audiences, both within and beyond Rwanda. 
Um, and then of course, as part of this, then there's a very significant public engagement element. And of course, this is where the topic of graphic novels come in. Um, we have decided to embrace graphic novels as one of the primary outputs of this project, um, because Rwandans seem to be really interested in graphic novels as a format, um, and also because it allows us to reach different kinds of audiences, and in particular Rwandan youth who might not otherwise have much access to the kinds of oral traditions that we're working with. Um, so just to give you an example then of what some of these materials look like, um, this is just a quick screen capture of um, the story of Nyirgitwa, daughter of Sachega. And this is the primary source then that serves as the foundation for the first graphic novel that we've published, which is just called Nyirgitwa. And this is the name then of a 17th century woman um, who I'll, I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a moment, um, but just who caught our interest immediately as this very, very interested, quite, quite transgressive um, young woman um, who became the, the sort of subject of, of an oral tradition that we uncovered in the Vancina collection. Um, and so this is a collection that was created between 57 and 61 um, by the Belgian historian Jan Vancina and was then archived at the University of Chicago. Um, the oral tradition is grounded in a story that was first told by a man known only to us as Daniel Mugabe in 1958. Um, and we've tried, but we've been unable to track down any of his sort of extended family. Um, we've then taken the original Kenya Rwandan source, um, as well as a French translation that Vancina's team provided back in the day. Um, and we've worked then to translate that into English. We then created a storyboard and the storyboard was co-authored by myself and Jerome Aaron Hunda. Um, it was then illustrated by Christian Mafajiri and then we've had ongoing feedback from different country partners, as well as members of Nteko Azurkana, which is the Council of Elders in Rwanda. Um, and this is basically what it looks like. Um, so the graphic novel has actually been published now and we're using it as a starting point then to just sort of test how well this will be received, not only by Rwandan audiences, but in particular by the government, because some aspects of this graphic novel are politically sensitive. Um, we think it's a really important story because it speaks a lot to the ways in which women, and especially semi-elite women, could potentially transgress what we understand to have been gender norms at the time. Um, my, we're almost out of time. You can see, <laughs> sorry. Um, a, minute, a minute left. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a lot about this transgression of what are held to be the kind of gender norms at the time. Um, and in particular with the story, Nirgitwa over the course of it becomes um, a chief in her own right, as well as a sort of spiritual figure as well. Um, but there are moments in the creation of this graphic novel and in discussions around it as well, where um, uneasiness with um, the kind of feminist themes that are coming out of this have emerged, um, particularly with their country partners, a concern that perhaps we're reading too much into it, a kind of feminist agenda, transgressive gender norms and so on. Um, and likewise, there's also at times uneasiness that the narrative that comes out of this um, perhaps calls into question the novelty of the current government's efforts to promote gender equality. And this is something that's, that would be quite taboo in the present. Um, so we've had to really grapple with these issues in different ways. Um, and of course, it's made slightly easier by the fact that the people that we're talking about in this graphic novel are not currently living today and indeed might have been entirely mythical. Um, when we get into the oral traditions um, and so on that we're creating with elders, of course, then the challenges of this become a lot more difficult because these are people who are still living. Um, so I'm just out of time. I'm just going to quickly switch to the end because... Erin, if you'd like to take a couple of extra minutes, I just got a message saying that that's okay. Ooh. We started a little bit earlier, so please go ahead. Ah, okay. Okay. So I can just quickly talk about the other? All right. Um, so the second one then, which is not yet published, um, we're waiting to see what happens with Niramazimbu, um, sorry, Niragitwa before we, we move into this one, um, is a series of life history interviews that we've conducted with an elderly woman um, named Niramazimbu. Um, and again, this, is, this has been a very slow process because of her advanced age. Um, we're doing short interviews over many, many years. Indeed, we've done about eight so far. Um, and again, this is a fabulous story. Um, Niramazimbu was a very powerful spiritual leader in her youth. And um, with the spread of Christianity and European values, she gradually became increasingly stigmatized as a devil worshiper. And indeed in her community today is really looked down upon. Um, and so we're sort of using our life history as a way to start a conversation about what it meant in Rwanda, particularly for women's spiritual authority um, to, to encounter this, this spread of Catholicism in particular, um, but other kinds of European values as well. And another thing that's quite interesting about this story is that it's, um, it's the life history of a woman um, who's of Hutu heritage or formerly of Hutu heritage. 
Um, and so she talks about her entire life, including the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, but from a perspective you don't often encounter in Rwanda in that it's coming from a Hutu who lived through these events rather than say a Tutsi genocide survivor. Um, and again, this has been very much a collaborative process. Um, you can see from the photos here, these are all taken by Mark Ellison. Um, but, you know, it's really been a case of, you know, the whole family and at times the whole community coming in and giving feedback on the graphic novel, um, which isn't published, but we printed off for her so she could kind of see and give feedback on at different stages throughout. Um, so just to conclude quickly then, overall, um, the graphic novel project, it's proven to be a very, very rewarding way of engaging with these different kinds of difficult histories and bringing these stories out of the archives, out of communities and to a broader um, audience. But of course, there are real limitations to it as well, and in particular, the political implications of the stories that we're trying to tell um, have been challenging. These, these difficult histories that we're coming up against um, can often be conflated if we're not careful with genocide denial, genocide ideology, and other um, legal prohibitions that exist in Rwanda today. Um, and likewise, we've encountered significant challenges with publishing in Kenya, Rwanda, and explicitly for Rwandan audiences, because of course, for many publishers, they just don't see the potential for profit in graphic novels that are really targeting Rwandan audiences rather than say a more mainstream, you know, Anglophone audience or a Francophone audience. Um, so I will, I will conclude there. Thank you so much for the extra time and I look forward to questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Erin. So a reminder to everyone to put their questions in the chat or note them down if you'd like to ask them later. Thank you so much. So now we're going to hear our second presentation. Um, our second presenter is not able to be with us here today, but luckily we're going to be hearing a video of her presentation that Cynthia is going to play. So our next presenter is Eleanor Bell. Eleanor Bell is a senior lecturer in English studies at the University of Strathclyde. She's the author of Questioning Scotland, Literature, Nationalism, Postmodernism, published in 2004, and co-editor of Scotland in Theory, Reflections on Culture and Literature, published also in 2004. Her current research focuses on the literary culture of the Scottish 60s, on which she has published two co-edited volumes, The International Writers' Conference Revisited, Edinburgh 1962, published in 2012, and The Scottish 60s, Reading, Rebellion, Revolution, published in 2013. She was founding co-editor with Scott Haynes, of the International Journal of Scottish Literature from 2006 to 2010. Eleanor is currently writing a monograph of Scottish literary magazines from 1960 to 1990. And now we'll hear her presentation. Thank you. So just let me know uh, if there's a problem hearing the sound. Okay, Kelly. Hello, everyone. I'm really sorry that I'm not participating in this session live today. I have to attend a couple of uh, exam boards, so really sorry about that. I'd like to talk to you about my current research on Scottish literary magazine culture. And my current research is on Scottish literary magazines from the 1960s to the 1990s. And one of the main things that interests me about these publications is the key debates that they capture at the intersections between literature, culture and politics, all at a very interesting time in Scottish literary and political culture. So taking into account, for example, the, the lead up to the failed referendum on uh, devolution in 1979, and also what many critics have discussed as a time of political and cultural pessimism, uh, during Thatcherism and so on. So from the 1960s to the 1990s, a variety of important magazines and journals engaged with the intersections of, of Scottish culture, literature and politics. While magazines such as Chapman, uh, King Crastus were uh, primarily literary focused, other magazines such as Radical Scotland and Scottish International were more politically minded. But with a few significant exceptions, most of the editors and contributors to these magazines were men. In the 1980s, however, a shift began to take place in Scottish literary culture, leading to the need for a broader recognition of women's voices and the republishing of the work of many women 
which had been out of print for decades. So magazine ca uh, culture helps to capture the need for this recognition um, of, of the representation of women more broadly in society. My research then has been drawing quite heavily on oral history reflections from significant contributors and magazine editors. And the main objective of my current research project is to prepare a cultural history, a book length study of this specific period of Scottish literary history. So it's perhaps unsurprising that most of the contributors and editors of the magazines from the 1960s to the 1990s were men. Um, in my oral history interviews, therefore, it's been really interesting to gauge this from a historical vantage point to ask editors and contributors to reflect back on what the legacy of these magazines were, uh, what it was rather, and also um, uh, and also to think about issues such as gender and how things have changed uh, since then. So many of my interviewees now, for example, recognise this strongly masculine bias uh, in the magazines. Um, um, and some of this, in some ways, the strong focus on national, uh, on national issues at the time in Scottish magazines pushed the issue of gender to the side. Despite their strong literary elements, many of the key magazines were also testing out the political state of Scotland, as you can see here on this cover from Chapman magazine, which is um, devoted to, to the state of Scotland um, and the predicament of the Scottish writer writing uh, during this particular moment. The, the importance of the national and, and pushing the issue of gender to the side is something that critics have picked up in the last decade or so, reflecting back on this period. The critic Suzanne Hageman, for example, uh, has pointed out that this focus on nationhood was often at the expense of women. She points out that Scottish culture during this period was often associated with small nation syndrome. So the issues of gender were, were pushed to the background necessarily. She says that gender is a comparatively recent issue in Scottish literary criticism. It is obviously true of all Western cultures that women's writing and the theme of gender in literature pre precede the advent of feminist criticism. But Scotland lagged behind in another more significant way. While gender rose to prominence in Anglo-American criticism in the late 1960s and early 1970s, in Scottish criticism this didn't happen until the early 1990s. One of the main reasons it has been argued is the quest for Scottishness, the small nation syndrome, involved focusing on the quiddity of Scotland. So um, this double bind then uh, of, of women being held back by their gender in discussions of nationhood and by the nation in discussion of their gender is something that Joy Hendry has explored in detail. Um, and Joy Hendry has the accolade of being the first female editor of a Scottish magazine. Uh, and she edited Chapman from the 1970s from, for over 30 years. So Hendry has turned this double bind of women being held back by their gender in discussions of nationhood and the nation in discussions of gender as what she refers to as the double knot in the peony. And the, the peony is the uh, Scots word for a pinafore or apron, uh, therefore symbolising the constraints of the domestic sphere. So Hendry has written on this saying that writing is a claim to power. Scottish women were at one removed from the seats of power by being first female and secondly Scottish. You can't deal with uh, one without the other. Scottish culture as a whole is a neglected area, lacking in status and prestige. A Scottish woman writer shares their neglect with her male colleagues, as well as being overlooked and underestimated because she is a woman. Thus, the women writer, rare enough anywhere, is even rarer in Scotland. The Scottish women writer must overcome the inferiority feelings stemming from her femininity and those stemming from her Scottishness. It's the double knot in the peony. So that's the context then out of which is, is based on. And a key issue of Chapman was woven by women, which was, was pioneering for its time in 1980. This edition brought to light the work of many writers who'd been neglected for decades, as well as raising the contribution of, of women to Scottish society. And an important strand of my research will be documenting the influences that magazines had on changing people's perceptions, 
informing and perhaps even influencing the direction of culture um, at the same time. Uh, Chapman then, Syncrasis is another key magazine um, and this, this cultural struggle for women's voices to be heard was also apparent early on in Syncrastis. Uh, Syncrastis was founded by a group of postgraduate students at Edinburgh University and its first edition was published in 1979 at a key point in Scottish cultural and political history. Commenting on the origins of the magazine, Raymond Ross has written that Kinkrasis was born in the dark days of post-referendum Scotland in the immediate aftermath of the devolution deb debacle. Um, so as part of my research so far in terms of my oral history engagement with this project, um, I've interviewed Cairns Craig, who was a key um, uh, part of, of the, 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 the team who put Kinkrasis together. He helped to found the magazine. And one of the central issues that he's referred to then in, a, a, in editorial meetings of the time was the growing awareness of women's issues, the growing need for women to have a more representative space uh, within the magazine and by extension in Scottish culture. So uh, when I interviewed him then about this, he said that very quickly, the main conflict was around feminism because the main group which had established the magazine regarded nationalism as the prime issue. But a lot of women who joined the magazine felt that nationalism was just a mask for masculinism and that the problem in Scotland was a lack of representation of women or lack of resources for women. So there was quite a lot of conflict, but debate um, around what national, nationalism actually meant in Scotland and whether it could only be a Scottish nationalism if it was also a Scottish feminism or whether feminism was a cosmopolitan movement that had very little to do with Scottishness. And so there were quite a lot of underlying tensions around those issues at the time. So for Craig then, he goes on to say that there was, there was quite a lot of not conflict, but debate around what nationalism actually meant in Scotland, whether it could only be a nationalism if there was also a Scottish feminism, or whether feminism was a cosmopolitan movement that had very little to do with Scottishness. And so there was quite a lot of underlying tensions around these issues. So this has been a very brief snapshot of the context of women's contribution to literary magazines during this period. Um, that while the past few decades in Scottish cultural and political history have often been especially fraught, especially around the 1979 and 2014 referendums, my research has been looking at the way in which, through chasing through the significant contributions of writers and critics, it becomes clear that Scottish literary magazine culture has nonetheless helped to generate important new platforms for discussion and reflection along the way. So indeed, the feminist interventions within Scottish literary and cultural magazines often offer nuanced readings of Scottish cultural identity, um, which have still to be properly integrated into the history of feminism of Scotland more broadly. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm so glad we were able to listen to Eleanor's presentation. Thank you, Eleanor, if you're listening to this recording. And now I'm going to present our final uh, paper, which is by Kate Wilson. Kate Wilson is a PhD student at the University of Strathclyde, supervised by Dr. Eleanor Bell and Dr. Angela Barty. Her AHRC funded PhD thesis titled Towers and Schemes in Revolt, Community Literature and Cultural Activism in Glasgow, 1968 to 1992, investigates the relationship between Glasgow's post-war urban regeneration projects and the city's local literature using both archival research and oral history. Her research interests include community literature and publishing, cultural activism, and urban regeneration. Welcome, Kate. Thank you very much, Kelly, and thanks everyone at Codes and, and the Scottish World History Centre for having me. Um, I'll just share my screen. Get shares done. Can you all can you all see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, good, fab. Um, so just to start then um, for a bit of context, Scotland in the 1980s 
um, was an, an era of significant challenges for both the women's movement and also for working class culture um, and community with um, widespread deindustrialization and also um, an assault on organized political struggle in the, in the Thatcher era. But paradoxically, in the midst of all these challenges, there's something of a boom in literary production, both by women and by working class writers. So on one hand, you, and you saw this in a bit more depth in Eleanor's paper, you've got feminist interventions in literary magazines, and you've also got women-only writers groups like Pomegranate and Hens in the Hay. But to an extent, these are predicated on existing predominantly middle-class social networks. And on the other hand, you've got a radical adult education movement, which is spawning writers groups um, in, in working class areas based on principles of non-hierarchy and also the, the pedagogy of Paulo Freire um, with the idea of culture being a tool for, for raising class consciousness. But I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking about here is where do working class women fit into all of this? So for the purposes of this, I'm going to look at a women-only writers group in Castlemilk, which is in the southeast of Glasgow. And so for context, um, in the 1970s, uh, residents of Castlemilk uh, engaged in a lot of grassroots community action, um, often to do with feelings of, of urban regeneration, often led by women um, and often within spheres of social reproduction, so related to housing, childcare and, and education. And you can see this here from Cast Milk Today, which was a grassroots community newspaper. Um, women were writing and, and leading on articles about politics and their community at the time. So moving into the 1980s, uh, the Castle Milk Writers Workshop began in 1984. And initially the, the workshop existed only as a mixed gender group. And you can see there are two publications here. And before an offshoot women only group began um, a few years later. And when I asked one of the tutors why the women's group began, she told me a story about a woman going to read her work after two men had finished reading theirs, but she wasn't able to be heard um, because of the noise of men putting their, their own work away in the filing cabinet. So this is um, what, what she told me here. I won't read it all out for time, but um, you know, women's voices weren't regarded as important. And you know, this final part here, if male working class experience isn't regarded as that, female working class experience is even less regarded as the stuff of literature. So that was why we started it. So even within the context of a workers' educational association writers group linked to ideas of, of giving voice to the voiceless, women's voices were still considered to be secondary to men's. And that was something that was really evident um, in the testimonies of the women too. So in every single uh, case, they, they highlighted that they felt they weren't worthy of producing literature before they took part in the group. Sorry, here's my cat. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, uh, so strikes me. And the, the women in the women only group, um, there was a greater emphasis on reading the work of others. Um, of, of other people in the group and also of female writers like Maya Angelou and, and Marge Piercy. And there was a greater push for self-reflection as well. They talked about their own interpretation of literary themes and they also shared and, and gave value to their everyday experiences um, in, in this kind of non-hierarchic space. So it wasn't a directly feminist entity, but it, but it certainly had echoes of, of, of feminist consciousness raising groups. So this is Karen who attended both groups talking about the difference um, of or between the mixed group and, and, and the women's group? They were both very distinct groups. They were very different. I uh, The women's group was, uh, if I could describe something as beautiful and very supportive. And we were all, I think it would be honest to say, we were all damaged women coming in for different directions and for different reasons. Um, the, the mixed writers group was that was where I could let my fighting side out. <laughs> where there was many, many battles. Men have got a different a woman would bring in half a bring up half a poem. And I'm really a wee bit apprehensive about this. The men would put down a collection. <laughs> So this type, of, this type of description has come out um, a lot um, in interviews, so words like beautiful, nurturing, supportive, encouraging, and this really allowed women to share visceral um, and, and uh, sometimes in, in some cases semi-autobiographical work on things like poverty and, and domestic abuse. So this is an extract from a story um, by Mary Johnson, 
and in it, a, a woman's abusive partner has just been released from prison and it ends um, here with her confronting him to say, um, you know, he, he confronts her and she, she replies, you know, so now I want you to go. You're not welcome here. I don't want to see or speak to you again. So, you know, this is a kind of turning point in the narrative and sort of centres this survivor, which is important for a number of reasons. So firstly, you know, we heard earlier there was a perception that female working class experience didn't have a place within the literary canon. Um, so pu publishing something like this, even in itself, is a, is a kind of rejection of what these women have been told constitutes literature. Um, and it also offers a reframing of, of victimhood and, and stigmatisation, which women in, in Cast Milk were doubly subject to. So there's an expression of, of working class womanhood and also which runs counter to the idea of, of the scheme as a place without agency. And, and the work often deals with feminine solidarity as well. And you, you can see this in the work of Karen Johnson, who we, Karen Thompson, sorry, who we heard from earlier. Um, and here's two poems from Karen, uh, both of which are, are great. In the first, she reflects on the bond within the group um, and its ability to sort of bring a, a greater sense of selfhood. You know, she says um, in, in this poem here, you know, we, we wrap around our arms around each other and instantly we know what the heart searches for. Um, and, and the other is, is gentlemen, which is a kind of redefining of a man's place in the world. Uh, you know, we have you bottled, pure and simple, your thrust is redundant. Um, you know, I give, I give you the finger through the frosty air as I swagger away. You know, it's, uh, th so there's really quite, um, quite strong um, feelings come through here. But that's not to say it was all sort of love within the group or it was all kind of positive feminine solidarity um, or even that everyone shared a uh, political or feminist perspectives. You know, I heard about women having stand up fights about cleaning the stairs um, and also about other aspects of, of domesticity and motherhood as well. But, but most generally, people kind of remembered these groups as a place where they could identify their commonalities despite these differences. And, and in her own life history as well, Karen really centred the experiences at the writing group as a turning point. You know, she told me really repeatedly that all came from those wee groups talking about her own sense of self and, and development of, of political ideas as well. And Karen really placed a considerable emphasis on the transformative capacity of the groups, what they kind of helped her to go on to deal with afterwards, and also as a gateway to wider community networks as well. But I guess despite all of the positives of, of the group, there were some limitations as well. So the anthology, the anthology has a number of poems which deals with the feelings of authorities, um, particularly around poverty, uh, joblessness and, and housing. So this is, um, if you can read it, as Linda Henderson's For the Scheme. Um, and you, you've got these lines here, you know, don't show them back courts because they're in such a state, send them all home happy, they're say we're doing well, giving them such nice things will pal, it's a living hell. So, and it's this kind of critique of interventions into the schemes, which we weren't really sort of dealing with material reality or the root causes of the issues. And, and this also comes out in the testimonies as well. So uh, Karen again outlined this, um, which I won't play you just for time. But again, she was talking about, you know, that no matter what, that we safe room, both of those we safe rooms and safe, safe zones couldn't protect us out there. You know, so I, 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 similarly, the women also spoke about being overwhelmed by, by pain of trauma within the group, um, this being their only outlet for these things and, you know, facilitate, facilitators speaking about not really being equipped necessarily to take on these roles. And this kind of shows um, the writer's group for what it was in some ways, which was a sort of a, a minimal, ephemeral urban intervention in an era of a residualising welfare, welfare state. Um, so in this kind of view, the, the writers group provided a space for women who had suffered um, trauma and, and, and uh, quite some difficult lives in some cases to build a sense of the collective, but it had kind of long, limited long term ability to protect them. And, and instead, it was it was some of the community networks, which I alluded to earlier, that allowed um, you know, women to go on to develop their writing um, and in some cases their activism and, and themselves. So just to sum up quickly, um, it's probably important to question whether the writers groups and, and the sense of sisterhood and solidarity um, that enabled was, was really sufficient. So for all of their potential to act as a starting point for political and creative and, and self-development, there's probably an argument to be made that the type of introspection and, and the, you know, the the function of the group encouraged, um, you know, pe people in Cast Milk, it, it was, perhaps a, at best a sticking plaster to ameliorate ills of Thatcherite policy. And at worst, it can probably be seen 
as part of the type of individualistic self-betterment schemes offered to places like Castle Milk in the 1980s. So maybe rather than understanding writers' groups and all their transgressive potential as an end in themselves, um, oral narratives really help us view them as another link in a chain of community politics um, and movements like the women's liberation movement and, and help us view that for, for some participants it was, it was a starting point for a process of genesis um, which helped them arrive at these type of networks um, by helping them see that their voice was valued. So I'll leave you very, uh, just as we finish, um, with a quote um, from Mary Johnson, who you heard from earlier. Um, and uh, I think this encapsulates some of the concerns um, better than I can. So she says, don't mock or condemn us, we've just started the fight. If we get the chance, we'll make the future better if powers that be give us what we need and not what they think we want. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate. So thanks to our three presenters for sharing their work with us. And uh, now that we've heard from them, we'll open up the floor for our discussion. I'd like to remind the audience members that you can use the raise hand feature if you wish to ask a live question, or you can also write your question into the chat. Um, I thought I would just start things off with a question for our two presenters. Um, just hearing your different presenta your presentations, I was thinking a lot about genre, and I would just invite you both to reflect on um, why would certain genres or formats, such as, as magazines or um, anthologies, be more conducive to conveying women's histories? So is there something about the particular genre that was made it an ideal vehicle to convey these histories, or that women that you interviewed were naturally drawn to when you, um, when you were listening to their stories? And that would be for both presenters to reflect on. Who would like to go first, Erin or Kate? Um, both are on mute, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I can go, I guess. So, so you're asking about the, 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 the vehicle of the magazine and, and the, type, the type of format. I think probably, you know, while one of the important things about the stuff I look at is, is it's self-published in a way, you know, it's not, um, we're not really thinking about it in terms of you know wider sort of publishing networks and I kind of alluded to that that a lot of those are you know participation in those is kind of predicated on being part of maybe more middle class social and professional networks which wasn't necessarily something that a lot of women's and women's schemes like Cast Milk had access to um, so the, the fact that it was self-published you know there, there was a lot of autonomy and you know they were able to edit and create and, and all that sort of stuff um, and also, I, I guess it's really thinking about it as a product of the writers' group itself as well. You know that it, it, it's as well as as well as the the sort of the, the literary artifact um, being something that I'm interested in. I'm really interested in the sort of social connections and and the things that were enabled um, within that specific space. You know, again, ideas of agency and autonomy and sort of um, you know, creating something for yourself and, and seeing that outcome and maybe that then leads to an interest in being published elsewhere, but but it's that kind of, you know, sort of having ownership over something um, which you maybe was a space that you might have felt excluded from um, before, uh, from that sort of literary sphere almost. Um, so, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of, in, in terms of the stuff that I look at, um, it tends to be mostly that that sort of self-published rather than you know, um, I mean you've got really prominent feminist publishers at, at that time, but but I'm I'm sort of really interested in that sort of self-published, um, where where these women have got control over something and are able to kind of find their voice and not have it sort of moderated by anything else. Does that does that answer, does that answer yeah, the question? Yeah, very much. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, for my part, um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'm not so sure, I mean, with the graphic novel approach, I'm not really so sure it's necessarily more conducive for telling or showing women's history, but it's more a nice way to be able to, to talk about, you know, more difficult, challenging, contradictory aspects of Rwandan history without leaving people feeling too exposed. Um, a lot of Rwandans today, um, as much as I love digital media, um, they're very, very cagey about being filmed or even audio recorded at times talking about certain things. And I think, I mean, maybe for women, this this is one moment where there maybe is a particular sort of gender angle to this. Um, 
I think especially where maybe some of their actions they're not quite so proud of because it perhaps is transgressive of today's gender norms, you know, being able to present them as kind of a character in a graphic novel that can be made to look like anybody maybe gives them a bit more freedom to, to speak. Um, but the format is just, it's so wildly popular in Rwanda at the moment that it really just seemed like a natural way of, of you know, getting these stories out there, but not in that kind of, you know, more dry sort of standard academic format of a book or an article that might then by virtue of where it's being published and how it's being published be completely inaccessible to Rwandan audiences. So, so it wasn't just about the kind of gender angle, but, but yeah, I can see potential benefits to it in that regard. Thank you so much. I was wondering if the format appealed to different age groups as well, um, youth as well as older people. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so I'm going to turn to the questions in the chat. Sorry, just take me a moment to get up there. Um, so we have a question from Stephen High. Um, Rupert Bazambanza's graphic novel of a one woman survival in 1994 raises a lot of questions about how to visually represent ethnicity. And this is for Erin. How are you approaching this? Yeah, that's a, that's a really challenging question again, just to give people a bit of context. I mean, it's taboo in Rwanda today because of the genocide for people to speak about themselves in terms of their ethnicity and to speak about others in terms of ethnicity. Um, so we're often in this really difficult position where in private and certainly in the oral traditions that Vansina documented, um, ethnicity is talked about all the time. Um, Vansina particularly was, was working at a moment in Rwanda where they were moving towards independence and ethnic relationships and so on were, were a big part of that, like sort of teasing through all these, um, you know, stereotypes about the different ethnic groups and so on. Um, one of the ways we've tried to deal with it is by focusing on other forms of identity um, that Rwandans would have adhered to at the time. So things like their clan background, the region that they're from, their socioeconomic status, um, you know, other, other potentially important um, signifiers of identity, um, rather than explicitly talking about ethnicity. But there are certainly moments, and, and I think especially visual moments, where a person's ethnicity, I think, can be read very clearly in, in the way that the story is taking shape. So, you know, it's, it's kind of one of these things that's impossible to get away from, um, though that's very much what's expected of, of people who work in Rwanda today. Um, so yeah, it's just, it gets very, very complicated. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think I'm going to just, one more question for Erin, just because it's, it's linked um, from Barbara Lorenzowski. Uh, my question concerns the iconography of the graphic novels. Erin, how did you settle on the visual language of these novels and how and to what extent did the project aspire to draw upon traditions of Rwandan iconography? Yeah, again, another really good question and quite a challenging one. Um, with, with the earlier one, the one that's talking about um, a 17th century Rwandan woman, um, obviously we don't have a visual record of what life in Rwanda would have been like then. And so we spent a lot of time with um, the artist Christian Fajiri in like Rwandan museums and stuff and, and talking to Rwandans as well, like expert historians and, and the like, um, to get a sense of what they think the clothing would have been like. Um, you know, we talked a lot about like archeological findings were relevant in terms of what people might've worn, what their homes might've looked like. And then we tried to build that all into the graphic novel um, so that it was as much as we could based on what people at least could imagine Rwanda to have been like at the time. Um, with more recent, with the more recent graphic novel, the one on your Mzungu, um, we were able to draw a little bit more on photographs um, because of course, you know, at least since about 1908 or so, there's quite a wealth of photography. It's mostly of colonial origin again, it'll be German and Belgian colonizers, missionaries and so on who are taking photos of London people. So there's also really significant questions around that kind of representation. Um, and the extent to which people were able to consent to these. Um, but we did look at that and, and we showed some of these two in Yerma Zimbu to get her to reflect on, you know, was that an accurate depiction of how she remembered life at that point? And, and again, getting feedback from her, her family, other elders that we were working with. And again, then it was to Christian to kind of re, you know, reimagine this in a, in a graphic novel form. Um, we really like with the visual aspect, we really, really wanted this to be a graphic novel that Rwandans would look at immediately recognize as, you know, this is Rwanda. So, you know, we really tried to, to do right by them, but um, obviously Rwandans are quite diverse. There's a lot of regional variation and so on. So it's again, quite complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. 
Um, we have a question that came in for Kate from Stephen High. Great presentation, Kate. I noticed that your transcript of your interview with Karen included phonetic spelling, could me and Dane. Excuse me if I mispronounced that. I would love to hear more about why you approached it this way. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's uh, for me, uh, uh, as well as, you know, I think it's when everyone I've interviewed, I think it's been Glaswegian and, you know, this, there's an idea of this is, you know, the, the way that they speak, but also in terms of writers like Karen as well, um, even going beyond just an oral history perspective, she was, uh, although it wasn't in her two poems that I showed you there, I don't think she wrote in vernacular uh, Glaswegian as well, you know, that and, and was part of a movement um, through association with the work uh, with the writers group movement and and writers like James Kelman and and Tom Leonard was a real kind of push for sort of um valorization of, of working class in um, Glaswegian vernacular um so and, and so I know personally that that was something that was important um to Karen and and a lot of the other interviews that, that I spoke to the majority of them um would you know would write poems and and in, in Glaswegian um vernacular as well um, so there was a kind of a, an association with this and sort of a validization of working class um, language and a sort of situating that within within the literary canon. So I think that that adds a kind of new dimension to it as well, because it's, you know, for me to then to transcribe that and sort of impose, you know, a, I guess like you know, pre precise English on it would be sort of taking away a lot of that, which I know was was something which was really valued within that literary movement and something which was really valuable to to Karen in this instance, and also um, to the majority of, of other writers that I interviewed as well. I hope that does that answer. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I have another one for Kate that's come in from Arthur McIver. Brilliant presentations. I have a question for Kate. Do your female narratives allude to the gendered impacts of deindustrialization in Glasgow, including how these changes were navigated within the household or family? Um, that's that's really interesting. We certainly the, the main part that I've really pulled out of the narratives in terms of deindustrialization is um, the impact um, on the schemes themselves, or uh, you know, in this case, Castle Milk, but but also um, I looked at another writer's group in the East End as well, and as kind of the you know the the, the negative impacts of deindustrialization and joblessness, and um, you know just how just how hard life was. Um, in these places and in terms of home life it's not really something that come, that has come up but certainly I've spoken to women who worked um, in weaving um, and there was a there's a woman who wrote a play about um, about a, a mill and, and the closure of the mill so dealing rather than dealing with the with the sort of the impact on the home of deindustrialization um, aside from kind of you know just the broader negative impact dealing with the actual deindustrialization is that there's also a focus on on women's role and as workers and and how that changed as well thank you so much so we have a direct question um that's come through from sebastian I, yeah <clears throat> thank you kelly yeah, it's like uh, since we are in oral history, I wanted to ask my question directly, but then I put it in the chat because I was not sure. But uh, basically, I just wanted to ask to uh, Aaron um, if you could explain a bit more like the, 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 the process of mediation between those stories and turning that into a like, completely different format, like, like the involvement, who has been involved, how it's been uh, taken care of, and who made the, the important decision of selecting or not selecting certain aspects of, of those stories. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, it's been quite a, a time-consuming process, basically deciding which which stories should be told in this format and which ones shouldn't. Um, I mean, in the case of um, Rwandan elders, um, consent was a big part of it. Um, there were a lot of elders who were quite keen to speak with us, to tell us different oral traditions, to talk about their lives. Um, but even, you know, showing them graphic novels and explaining to them what the format looked like, some of them, I think, wanted to see what it would look like more specifically before they would agree. Um, in the case of Nyarimazungu, she was immediately really kind of thrilled by the idea and 
you know, like the format. And I think in particular, the fact that some of our grandkids were around when we had the initial conversation with her, what we were thinking about, and that they just immediately got really sucked into the photo, to the images and stuff. Um, that, that was basically why we decided to move forward with Nir Mazungu. Um, and indeed over the, over the years that we've been working with her now, some of the other elders in the community are quite keen to have their life story told in this way. So I think it will get more complicated going forward, <laughs> making that decision. Um, in terms of the oral traditions that are part of, you know, a more sort of, um, archival record um, or in the archives, um, we, we kind of made a decision as a team in conversation with the Rwandan Cultural Heritage Academy um, about which story would be appropriate to start with just because some of Bansina collection materials talk about ethnicity in a really problematic way. There's really unfortunate stereotypes about the monarchy or about people who oppose the monarchy. Um, and so even though they were really excited to, to be you know, engaging with these materials, then a lot of them raise some very significant questions about whether in a post-genocide context, these stories could be appropriate. Um, Nier Mazungu is one of the ones that was where there was fairly minimal risk in this regard. Um, and also it seemed everyone found really provocative just because um, none of the people we were working with had ever heard of the possibility of a woman becoming a chief in the Rwandan context um, or of amassing cattle, amassing wealth in her own right um, and a number of the other things that she kind of gets up to in the original oral tradition. And so they all thought this would be a really interesting one to start with just because it was so different from, from you know, what little exists on, out there about what Rwandan women's could, lives could be like at that time period. So that one was very much a, a kind of team decision. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. I have a question that's come up uh, for both presenters from Eleni Polikonakos. Fabulous presentations by all. Is there any way to reconcile nationalism and feminism? I'm thinking especially of Rwanda, where part of the reconciliation and peace process involved ensuring full participation of women in politics and other sectors. So maybe if Aaron would like to start with that one. Yeah, absolutely, I can start. Um, yeah, it's, in the Rwandan context, I mean, there's a very particular version of feminism, I think, that's become quite accepted um, within, you know, the current government's kind of official history of the country. Um, and one that I think in a lot of ways does a very effective job of kind of holding women up as, as people who should be equal participants in politics and so on. Um, but that's, that's not to say it isn't still leaving a lot of Rwandan women behind, and I would say particularly in rural contexts, um, there isn't a lot of um, improvement, measurable improvement at least, and meaningful improvement for a lot of Rwandan women. Um, and that's, that's a point in the country at the moment that's very touchy. Um, people who write about the ways in which um, rural Rwandan women are being left behind in gender equality um, tend to be then condemned for you know, being overly critical of the government and holding it to an unfair standard. So I'm not really sure if, if there is a way to reconcile the two. Um, I mean, even, even Rwandan women I know who in many ways benefit from the current sort of gender equality discourse in the country um, often find they're frustrated by it because really the only way they can be active participants in society is where they are sort of good wives and mothers. Like that's the, the phrase you hear again and again and again. And so they feel like if, if they don't wanna be mothers, if they, if they wanna divorce their husbands and so on, um, you know, heaven, heaven forbid they engage in same-sex intimacies or something, well, then there's no space for them in that, you know, in that gender equality, that vision of, of gender equality. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to always be hopeful about these things, but I don't know, I don't know how, um, how these things can be reconciled, the way that the, the gender equality policies are currently set up. Um, I think there need to be some very, very difficult conversations around some of these themes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. I'm wondering, Kate, did you have anything to add about that? Is there any way to reconcile nationalism and feminism? Sorry, Kelly, you cut out a wee bit there for me. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, <laughs> shall, I, shall I repeat? Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to, if, to add to that because the question was addressed to you both. Is there any way to reconcile nationalism and feminism? Um, I mean, in terms of in terms of my own research, it's not something that I, I deal with in any depth. I guess going back to Eleanor's presentation as well, which is is, is some of the, the the stuff that I touch on in the wider context, is thinking about, you know, Scotland as a a country with a preoccupation about nationalism at this time, and and women's right in being sort of considered to be of secondary importance to that, and, and feminism becoming a, an intervention. I mean, I think in the case of Scotland, you've probably got. 
um, maybe some uh, maybe a more interesting I'm looking at it from a literary perspective maybe some interesting ideas about you know how sort of these maybe sort of countercultural um, interventions at, at that point sort of become absorbed um, into into mainstream uh, nationalism uh, at a later time. But I mean, it isn't something that I look at in any, in any great depth in my research. Okay, thank you. There's a question for you, Kate. Um, just to follow up, it's of a different nature. A good one from Alison. Um, Alison writes, great presentations. I have another question for Kate related to Aaron's comments on women potentially feeling less exposed in the graphic novel format. I wondered if this was something that emerged in a different context in any of your research, Kate, and whether there were any conflicts or tensions between women's writing and their oral testimony. Yeah, that's that's really interesting thinking about, you know, about uh, feeling less exposed within it and it, it kind of relates um, to what I think about as well as just thinking about the literature, thinking about the function of, of the writer's groups and the function of doing the actual writing as something therapeutic and as something that's kind of outpouring. Um, certainly one of the, one of the um, people that I did an interview with, she was originally a writer's group participant and then went on to become a facilitator later specifically working with um, female addicts and, and would do that and she she actually told me that she would sort of have to temper what the, what they would write and um, you know sort of say you know don't don't write that you know it's, it's going to be it's going to be published so there's there's a I guess that that was the role of the, the facilitator who had the experience as as a writer's group um, participant as well as you know uh, seeing the, the therapeutic function of, of language and, and the sort of that, that feeling of you, you can't ex you know, express yourself in it and, and feeling less exposed, but also being aware that, that this is something that's sort of going to come in um, to uh, publication as well. And this is something that you're going to sort of, is going to be out there. Um, but yeah, I, th I certainly think that's a really interesting point. You know, a lot of the work is not necessarily autobiographical. It's not necessarily stated that it's autobiographical, but you know, it's, it's these sort of semi-autobiographical reimaginings almost, which, which is what you get. Um, with it, which I think is really interesting, um, you know, a, a sort of a, an opportunity to put yourself forward, but, but you know, write it in a sort of a, a you know, a, a humanist poem or write it with, with, you know, write it in something slightly fantastical and, and an opportunity to sort of, um, you know, reimagine difficult autobiographical situations, but but sort of um, you know, turning them around a little bit and, and, and making them something else and as a way to kind of work through them as well. Um, I hope that answers your question, Alison. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got about four minutes left of the session. I just want to make sure I haven't missed any raised hands. Does anybody have um, a question that they'd like to ask in person? You can just come on through and ask it if you if uh, if so. I'm just trying to look through here. Okay, one from Cynthia. Hi, thanks everyone so much for your talks. It was really great. Uh, this is a question that I would uh, ask uh, Eleanor if she were here, but definitely Kate, it's relevant for you too. You know, I'm just thinking about this great process that um, Aaron was talking about in terms of connecting the artist and their their visual representation of Rwandan women with the actual, you know, participants in this project who are Rwandan women. It just sounds very difficult, but it, extremely worthwhile and it made me think about you know these overlaps between memory uh, visual representation and literary representation and we saw the covers of these journals and they often had graphic art on them and I was just wondering were those any of those done by women that you know of was there art included in the journals visual art or photography just wondering if you could talk about that yeah and um, the certainly the, the one that I focused on uh, today the cast of uh, women even writers um, group publication there, the, the image that they have on the front, it's sort of like outlined in washing women's words. And actually that was something that we spoke about. I, th I don't actually know who did it, but I know someone in the group did it. And it was kind of, you know, the, the, it was purposefully homemade. They wanted, they didn't want it to look polished and professional. They wanted it to look like it was by them. Certainly it was, you know, a, a, this kind of homemade look. And I think there's something on the back cover as well. In terms of art stuff, they didn't do so much, but there is another writer's group um, who were called the East End Writers and Artists. And again, um, well, in fact, the Castle Milk um, Writers Group did have some visual, kind of more visual poems. For example, there was one specifically on deindustrialization, which is kind of like a gravestone with all the 
um, the list of um, closed factories on it, um, which is which that that was that wasn't done by by a female participant. That was done in the, in the mixed group. Um, so again, it was kind of I think the the writing tutor in this case was she, you know that was her um, her background was writing, so that was the emphasis really. But but certainly visual representations have come out, and this you know the same in the, the East End writers and artists, you know. The majority of it kind of you know hand drawn, but still these kind of expressions of, of of the same sort of stuff. So yeah, there is a lot of there is a lot of crossover um in that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're almost at time. Um I'd like to thank our three presenters for wonderful presentations. I wish Eleanor could have been with us today. Um, we didn't have time to address all of the questions in the chat, so perhaps if you didn't get a chance to ask, you could um, ask it in a breakout room or during one of the coffee breaks. And thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. It was a great start to the Summer Institute. Thank you, Kelly. did a great job moderating. Uh, and now we have a 15-minute break. We are actually exactly on time, which I find astonishing. And um, you should be able to join a breakout room. Um, I don't know if, oh, here we go, okay. So if you click on the button at the bottom of your screen that says breakout room, you'll see that there uh, is a room called research creation. Actually, we probably see different things because I'm a co-host. I don't know, Anna or Doug, if you want to weigh in on how people should be joining the breakout room. Uh, sure, um, Douglas might need to help me out here because I too <laughs> am seeing what you're seeing, but uh, I think yeah. folks, maybe if one of you could, uh, could help us out, if you're not seeing research creation, screening room, books, chat room, are you seeing all of this storytelling yeah. smokestack yet? Wonderful. So you could just go ahead and choose the room you'd like to move into. And Cynthia, I don't know if you wanted to explain further of, uh, or remind people what's happening in the screening room, et cetera. Uh yeah, so the Research Creation Screening Room has um, a, a playlist of projects curated by Emma Harake. So it's just a kind of little sampler of some work done uh, recently by Codes Affiliates using oral history in some way and also responding to the theme of embodiment or gender through different creative practices. And I take full responsibility for the names of the breakout rooms okay so if you're thinking mm, who chose that it was me so we can all you can also propose alternative names for the breakout rooms later if you feel troubled by any of them so I think you can just join and if you just need a break and you need to turn your camera off and get some tea no problem we will be starting back in 14 minutes for our next session called family gender and childhood so thank you again everyone from the first session that was fantastic Hello. And uh, I'll invite also those of you who are presenting in the next session to stay in this space with us so we can test your, your things. Everyone else, like uh, Cynthia said, feel free to go chat with some pals in the breakout rooms or just tune out for a bit. So thanks very much. So do we have Rebecca here, Georgia and Allison? Maybe we could just connect with you quickly. See, Alison and Rebecca are here with us, Cynthia. Okay. And Georgia's yes. joining, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So I don't know if Rebecca, would you like- I'm so sorry. Can <laughs> someone help me get in the room because I don't seem to be able to. Yes, you know, I- it, I don't when have I a look, say to, hi to access the room. I think, it, <laughs> I think it looks like, uh, and I think we actually do have to assign people. I'm not quite sure how to do oh, that. I though. See. So okay. I think we're just having a little technical difficulty here, Beatrice. But oh, what room would you, you like to be in? <laughs> uh, the screening room, creation the screening, screening room. room. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can do that. Oh, thank you. Yes, That's I working. Just, I just did. Okay, thank you perfect. so much. Appreciate thank it. You. Okay. So if we have Rebecca, sorry, I'm just doing, oh, hi, Rebecca, there you are. Would you like yep. to try uh, just testing your screen share? Sure, and just so you know, you're still recording. I didn't know if you wanted to record during the break or not. 
Yeah, we, uh, we, we cut this out uh, afterwards. Gotcha. The words. Okay. <laughs> I just know sometimes people leave it on and they forget. Um, yeah, you. I will go ahead and share my screen. I am a little nervous about the sound coming through, but we'll, we'll see what happens. When you do share, uh, when you press share screen, just be sure to click the little share sound box. Um, ah. as, there you go. Oh. Thank you. It's a good aha moment. Yes. All right. Can you, can you see your screen? Yeah. Can you see the slide? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, Do you want to just uh, move forward to, to make sure we can hear the the audio? Yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. And and, and Cynthia, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you run this. Okay, but she yeah, said he came to her that she was working in the weaving room and he came to Could you hear that? Sounds good. Yeah, sounds really good. Awesome. So I'm just going to interrupt to say, uh, Anna, there seems to be a problem with the screening breakout room. <laughs> there's just a message in the chat saying that there's nothing playing. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. That was great. You are you are free. <laughs> well, I'm and free until yeah. <laughs> you're free for ten minutes. And uh, Georgia, oh, you're uh, already doing it. Great. If I could just wait in for one second. Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm chair kind of the next session. What would work best for everybody in terms of the suggested time limit of 10 minutes? Should I just kind of, as Kelly, just gently wait in after 11 minutes and say there's one minute left? Or what would be your preferred way of managing time? That, what, what you said sounds fine to me. Um. <laughs> Perfect. So, so, so at the 10 minute and 30 second mark, I just gently chime in and say one minute left. And then you have actually kind of 60 to 90 seconds to wrap it all up. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry for waiting in there, Cynthia. Cynthia. No, no, no. It's good to do it before people run off to the bathroom, which is what I'll be doing. <laughs> okay, awesome. Hi, Barbara, by the way. Nice to see you. Oh, I, this is such a happy morning. It's such yeah, a it is really, Thanks, so Barbara. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Um, so I think we had Georgia, your yours your share worked okay, right? That wasn't my share. I oh, think that sorry. was the screening room thing. Um, but oh. I'll just check <laughs> that mine works. It should work fine. Uh where's my presentation going? There we go. That can you see that okay? Yes, we can see yeah. your screen. Okay. That's and fine. I don't have any sound or anything, so perfect. It, it's fine. <laughs> that looks great. Thank you so much. Hi, Alison. How are you? Hello, I'm I'm good, thank you. Um, yeah. I have I have a wee bit of sound, and I'm going to put my mic on in case the the I'll, I've got a, a mic to plug in in case my computer mic isn't very good. But I'll pop it on in a second. But I'll uh, okay. Do the stream sure. first. Um, da, da, da. I've got a bit of sound as well, so. So let's find. That was the bit, that was the, the wake up call for me, I think, as to how severe this lockdown was actually going to be. We can, we can hear it. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. I think that that's it. So everyone's got some time to either go into one of the chat rooms, but I can understand if you don't want to, I wouldn't be doing it if I were giving a talk right afterwards. <laughs> Save that for a bit later in the day. It'll be good. Okay, thanks everybody. Really looking forward to your talks and uh, we'll see you back here in about eight minutes, okay? All right, see you soon. Sounds great. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, Rebecca. We just have, we just have one minute to go. In fact, I think um, I'll just send everybody a message in the breakout rooms. Okay, that will prompt people to come back. <laughs> Thank you.
Cynthia, just uh, FYI, they also get a countdown clock of a 30 second countdown to the close. So well, it's 30 put them seconds. out of there, put them out That's, of there. Okay, that's good. So I'm never quite sure. I, when I do breakout rooms in my classes, it always feels like a rodeo. I just know <laughs> when will they? And then sometimes you send the message saying, okay, you've got a minute left and they all come back. So, and then we just stare at each other. So the adventures of Zoom, the endless adventures of Zoom. Okay. It's 10 o'clock, but we can, uh, well, people are coming back. We're, we're back up almost to the numbers we had before. So. Barbara, if you feel like starting, please, please go ahead. Absolutely. Welcome back, everybody. My name is Barbara Lewinskowski, and I'm delighted to be chairing the second session of the 2021 Summer Institute. I am based at Concordia University in the Department of History, though CODES, our Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling, is very much my academic home. Our conversation in the next hour will revolve around family, gender, and childhood. And I'm delighted to be introducing our three speakers for this late morning session. In turn, we start with Rebecca Chatelier. Rebecca Chatelier is a first year PhD student in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Science at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. Her research focuses on the deindustrialization of the textile industry in small communities, both in Scotland and the American South. It is a work that relies heavily on oral history methodology. Born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, Rebecca obtained her BA from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, and later her Masters of Liberal Arts from Tulane University in New Orleans. Her paper this morning is entitled Legacy of a Matriarch, an Inheritance of Stories. Rebecca. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. I hope everyone can see that. Great. All right. A few years ago, while on a trip with my mother back to her hometown, we stayed up visiting to the small hours of the night with her sister. Despite my 30 years, as I sat and listened to the sisters exchange old family tales, I felt transported back to the position of a child amongst adults, but the, with the ability to hear these stories through the filter of personal experience. One particular story had all three of us tearing up with laughter. Now, had I heard this story at a younger age, I probably would have been mortified and slightly scarred. But as an adult woman, I recognized and found humor in the horror and embarrassment. To set the scene, my great grandmother, Chloe, was working in the cotton mill when the superintendent, her supervisor, gave her some instructions. And I think they called him Old Man Malloy. I don't know why. But she said that he came to her, that she was working in the weaving room, and he came to her and quietly said, um, Chloe, you need to go home and don't go out the front. Go out the back and go straight home. And she said that she got out the door and looked down, and she, you really want to tell this story? She looked down, and she said there was, it was her time of the month, and that there was a huge blood clot. This is her words the size of a piece of beef liver on her shoe and that she was just mortified because that man had seen that. Chloe was born in the year 1900. She was about 21 at the time of this incident. I share this story with you because its relatability transcends the 100 years since its occurrence. Anyone present who has experienced menstruation has the ability to identify with Chloe and anyone who hasn't with old man Malloy. You may have also noticed before delivering the payoff of the story, my aunt hesitated, something she had not done in her previous telling. She was acutely aware of the recording in progress and the potential of it being heard in mixed company. So asked for reassurance on the appropriateness of recalling a story involving menstruation, one she doubtfully would have told in the presence of men. According to her grandchildren, Chloe was a consummate communicator through story. 
Indeed, my main memory of her is being placed at the foot of her rocking chair and instructed to listen. Unfortunately, most of my memories are of, of her stories culminate in the image of a young Chloe walking along railroad tracks. I am told this was a common pastime in her youth. Therefore, much of my understanding of her life story has been reconstructed and told through the framework of memories held by her daughters and granddaughters. An expert in family folklore, Karen Baldwin argues that a family narrative is a collaboration in which many people tell their two bits before the whole begins to make sense. In the last 25 years since Chloe's passing in 1996, the memories of my mother and her sister have taken on different perspectives and retain details that both intersect and defer. I hope to examine how time, memory, identity, and familial relation all interplay in the recall of a beloved ancestor and matriarch. In the process of interviewing my mother and aunt separately over Zoom, the relaxed interplay of collaborative storytelling while visiting had been removed. At times, I would be referred to someone else within the family to fill a gap, but mostly each woman spoke with authority on what they believed to be reliable recollections. Across the two interviews, four aspects of Chloe became the focus of their narrative remembrances. Her work as a woman, her health and physicality, her social aptitude, and what can best be described as powers. First, her work. After marriage and the birth of her first child in her mid twenties, Chloe left her job at the cotton mill to stay home and raise her family. According to my mother and aunt, this was a life of cook, clean, repeat. All the while raising five children and eventually helping to rear 18 grandchildren. There was always the constant presence of children, which she never seemed to mind, and an abundance of food. Though each remembered in detail the dishes she would prepare, my mother tended to focus on the process of cooking, whereas my aunt remembered vividly being taught to make and keep a sick bed. This is characteristic of what I know of each woman's personality. My mother takes much pride in her ability in the kitchen and my aunt is fastidious and a natural caregiver. While my great grandfather suffered from hearing loss due to his life's work in the cotton mill, the effect of multiple pregnancies, some ending in miscarriage and a life stooped over cooking and washing took a crippling toll on Chloe's body. Chloe would warn my mother that she would ruin herself if she conducted the chores of men, yet gave little thought to lifting 50 pounds of wet laundry to take out to hang to dry. This irony was not lost to my mother even in her youth. Due to osteoporosis, closed spine had fused resulting in a dowager's hump in later years, making the ability to perform household tasks difficult. Despite the pain it would cause, my aunt recalls she would still clean in anticipation of the arrival of the person hired to help with the daily chores. Be that as it may, and though diminished in body, Chloe did live to the age of 96. Another area of agreement between the sisters is that Chloe never went anywhere, not to any store, not to church on Sundays, with the exception of big meeting, a full day gathering at the Primitive Baptist Church Instead, her husband handled the shopping and she cooked. Her house was Grand Central Station, whether it be noon dinner when the lunch whistle would summon family and any number of extras from the mill to eat and given or any given celebration in which she would prepare dozens of pies and cakes. Though my recollection is of a small old woman in her rocking chair telling stories and sometimes snapping peas, for my mother and aunt, it is a woman full of charisma and energy, happily tethered to her kitchen. Her ability to create a space where all felt welcomed and cared for is perhaps the most indelible mark left by Chloe on her descendants. In remembrance, however, there was also rejection of those things they did not find socially pal palatable to their modern sensibilities. My mother still takes offense to the instruction by Chloe to pause her own meal in order to fix her older and capable male cousin a plate. And my aunt still questions the inequality in the expectation of female virtue to that of male. 
lastly, Flo had powers. She could talk the fire out of a bird, a faith healing tradition that may only be passed to an unrelated member of the opposite sex. My aunt recalled a, a story of a man severely burned at the mill who was first taken to Clo before being transported to the hospital. As well, both believed Clo to have psychic abilities and shared, albeit different, differing stories about Clo seeing her husband's face before ever meeting him. The story I always heard from Granny was that a friend of hers brought him to her house. She, they used to host, she used to lead dances is what she would, is the way she called it. So I was assuming they were at her house or a friend's house and they would move the furniture. And, um, and I think it was at one of these things that her friend brought him to meet her and said, I've met your husband and, and I'm bringing your husband to meet you. And so that's how I remember the story going. And when he got there and she met him, she had seen his face in the bottom of a well. She, she had always told me that on the longest day of the year, which is the summer solstice, that if you took a mirror and looked over backwards into a well, that you would see the face of the person that you would one day or were supposed to marry. And she always said that she saw grandpa long before she ever met. Alessandro Pertelli states that memory is not a passive depository of facts, but an active process of creation meanings. In the first story, my mother is detailed in the circumstances of her grandparents meeting. The factor of her having seen his face previously is almost an afterthought. Whereas in the second story, my aunt recalls nothing of her grandparents' actual meeting, but instead vividly remembers the ritual involving the well. To my mother, this extra ability finds worth in its applicability. Yet to my aunt, the mystics of the ability itself takes precedence in her memory. These differing perspectives highlight the practical and emotional sensibilities of each woman. And when combined, create a more fulfilling story. She, she had always told me. Though nostalgia was certainly at play throughout their storytelling, both my mother and aunt were quick to express gratitude to live as a woman in the present. They're, they recognized the hardships placed on clothes simply for being a woman in her time, They're, thereby making her achievements that much more amplified and exemplary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Our second speaker this morning is Georgia Granger. Georgia is a third year PhD student at the University of Strathclyde, um, who is undertaking research into the history of the sectomy in Britain in the 20th century. As part of this research, Georgia has interviewed men about the experiences of vasectomy between the 1960s and the 1990s, and then worked to situate this research within feminist oral history practice. Her PhD research also deals with wider issues of eugenics, reproductive autonomy, and individualizing public health care. Georgia currently is also undertaking an internship with the Scottish Arts and Humanities Alliance to promote the value of arts and humanities in Scotland. Her paper this morning is entitled History of Contraception Family Planning in Britain, Man's Contraceptive Decision Making. Georgia. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen here. Um, there we go. Can we, can everyone see okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, I am doing a PhD on the social history of vasectomy in Britain. I'm doing it out of the Scottish Oral History Centre and also the Centre for the Social History of Health and Healthcare at Strathclyde. Um, 
And I have interviewed some men about their experiences, mostly to help get a patient perspective, because um, I think it's important to be able to provide that perspective in a narrative which could easily be led by medical professionals. Um, so I want to uh, go through a few things. One second. There we go. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my kind of project as a whole and then specifically about men's narratives um, because my project as a whole kind of helps explain why I think feminist oral history is relevant to this. So as a whole, I go through the 20th century. Um, I'm looking at the shifts in narrative around vasectomy and in the kind of potential uh, proposed uses of vasectomy, which begin with proposals for eugenics. Eugenic vasectomy was never allowed in Britain. Um, there was a couple of small cases, like isolated cases of eugenic castration being performed, but as a whole, it was illegal. Um, I know that that is a different story in many other places, including Canada and the US. Um, in Britain, then the shift went on to kind of overpopulation concerns, particularly focused on India and China. And my research focuses on this organization, the Simon Population Trust, which is a um, kind of uh, they inherit the roles of the British Eugenic Society, and they were the first people to set up an, a vasectomy clinic in Britain. Then I go on to discussing vasectomies being provided on the National Health Service for free, which began in about 1972, um, and the integration of contraception as a whole onto the NHS from about 1974. Um, and then I have more focus on individual stories and the idea of people telling their stories. So I look at media, in particular advice columns and letters to the editor and stuff like that um, in the press. And then a kind of more theoretical idea of how all of this situates itself within our ideas of healthcare and bodies and gender and all those theoretical things. And my oral histories mostly sit within those last two sections so they're more recent um obviously based on when vasectomies were available in britain and who i was able to talk to and also the idea that um individual stories sit quite at odds to the national stories um so eugenics and overpopulation and then kind of individualized family planning are all these state level macro policies but actually the individual men's stories are quite different and don't take on the same narratives so part of the reason that i think this fits within the feminist oral history tradition is the idea that obviously gender is problematized and that in the same way that women have maybe been isolated, not maybe, women have been isolated from histories of work, of, you know, public life, that kind of thing. Men have also been excluded from many histories of families. So, for example, Kate Fisher and Simon Schretter, they do histories of contraception and um, contraceptive practices in the 20th century in Britain, but the, they interview women individually and they interview men as part of couples. And even where Kate Fisher talks about the need to include men, she also makes statements such as that men were uh, under these uh, expectations were encouraged husbands to consider their wives' sexual desires. The idea that a man is only considering these things, considering contraception, etc., for their wife. And I think that that's a really interesting reversal of the usual uh, narratives of women being considered in their relation to their husband. Um, you know, a woman as a wife and a mother or a daughter and a sister. Um, in contraceptive histories, men are quite often husbands or boyfriends or fathers. Um, and I think that that is part of why I wanted to interview men and specifically men by themselves rather than in couples. Um, a lot of them were married, but you know, I was talking to them individually. And again, Laura King in talking about fatherhood 
discusses the fact that fathers are not usually treated as individual historical actors and in histories of family life. They're kind of integrated into either an add-on to their wife, who is the historical actor, or just as part of the family unit. So I think it's important to talk about men as individual actors and the autonomy they had in choosing vasectomy, which was a procedure that ultimately was very directly affecting them. So these are some quotes from the interviews I did um, about why men chose a vasectomy. Um, and one of the things that came up quite a lot is that they were seen as a way to protect their wife or a way to kind of save their wife. And this agrees with um, some sociologists in New Zealand, Braun and Terry, who have looked at current contemporary narratives of vasectomy and this restructuring of masculinity to include saving a woman by providing the contraception. Um, typically in the form of vasectomy. So, you know, it's discussing that they were um, bearing the burden or that it was fair or that they were uh, keeping them safe. And this allows them to restructure masculinity to include something that perhaps wouldn't have been intuitively seen as a masculine act. And then the other thing that I've come across, which I find particularly interesting is that um, a lot of the men discuss this despite quite often saying that it was their own idea or that they first read about it and brought it to their wives. None of them discussed their wives having suggested it to them. Some were suggested to by their doctor. But in spite of this idea that it came from them originally, they discuss it as a couple um, and they talk about, we decided this, we chose to do this. It was going to be better for her. So we went to the doctor. And part of that was practicality to get a sterilization at this point in Britain, you, you need the consent of both partners, regardless of who was being sterilized. Um, but I think it also speaks to the fact that men are not used to seeing themselves as the actor and to be, given that individual responsibility. And a lot of the men I spoke to expressed that they had never really thought about their vasectomy in terms of gender or in terms of bodily autonomy, for example, the way that many women would have to think about their reproductive health and their reproductive rights. So out of that, some of my kind of key findings um, that I think are relevant to this are that Men's individual stories are very different to the stories being discussed in Parliament um, or in quite high level groups or uh, medical journals, which were primarily about population control. And indeed, the Simon Population Trust had a kind of a survey of their first thousand vasectomies in the early 70s. And despite the fact that their motivation was to con uh, combat overpopulation, not a single man listed overpopulation or eugenic or illness or hereditary stuff as the reason. It was all for freedom of being able to have sex, basically. Um, and I think that that really speaks to the fact that these narratives are important to include in this and that they offer um, an alternative to the messages behind legalizing contraception and bringing it on the NHS. And then also that men are reframing their masculinity in a way that allows it to be a masculine act to save their partner. But they are also then seeing themselves in contrast to their partner in this position, despite the fact that several men I interviewed had got divorced after and said that it was really helpful for them to have their vasectomy when they got divorced. At the time of the decision, they were still seeing themselves as part of a unit and that the decision was in that unit. So that is my findings so far. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Georgia. And our third speaker this morning is Alison Shand. Dr. Alison Shand is a tutor at the Scottish Oral History Centre at the University of Strathclyde, as well as a lecturer in history at the University of the Highlands and Islands. 
She also works as a freelance oral historian in various interviewing, transcribing, and advisor capacities, as well as a trainer with the British Library and the Oral History Society. Allison completed her PhD that focused on the experiences of men working in reserved occupations in Clydeside during the Second World War. Subsequently, she published a monograph based on her PhD dissertation that is entitled Masculinities on Clydeside, Men in Reserved Occupations During the Second World War. Currently, Allison is undertaking a most timely project, um, which is funded by the British Academy, into how parents with young children are experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic. Her paper this morning is entitled, I Just Remember Feeling Really Sad. Oral Testimonies of Pregnancy, Birth, and Early Parenthood in Britain during the COVID-19 pandemic. Alison. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and thank you very much to everyone for the papers this morning so far as well, which have been great. Um, I'll just pop some slides up here. Um, there we go. Uh, so um, yes, yeah, the, the research that I'm going to talk about this morning is a bit of de uh, a departure from my, my previous research and published work and not something I expected to be talking about um, this year um, in that it came about um, a bit by accident at the beginning of the, the pandemic last year um, and came about really as a result of me scrabbling around trying to work out how to use remote interviewing technologies um, as, as part of which um, I practiced on some unsuspecting friends um, at the in the very early stages of, of lockdown um, in 2020 um, who happened to be parents of small children um, and I, I was asking them about their experiences of of lockdown and and, and that snowballed into what will now be a, a two-year project looking at how um, parents of young children um, have experienced lockdown and the pandemic um, in, in Britain. Um, as part of that, um, so far um, this year, um, I've, I've now carried out 130 um, remote interviews with parents um, from a variety of backgrounds, they um, include numbers of, of, of children, um, parents, mothers, fathers, um, separated parents, uh, parents living in different uh, parts of, of the UK and in different employment situations and a key group within those um, which emerged has been uh, pregnant pregnant mothers and parents with um, small babies, um, particularly in the early stages of, of lockdown, I've interviewed quite quite a number of those who will, who will form the basis of, of what I'll talk about today. The, the remote interviewing technology is perhaps the subject for, for the discussion and it was something that was quite new to me and added a new dynamic um, to, to the interviews. I, I felt it well, made, them, made, made them different um, in, in a number of ways. Um, and, and part of the plan, this is this is work that is in process, in, in progress at the moment, and part of the plan is to, to carry out roughly 50 repeat, hopefully face-to-face -face, um, interviews towards the end of this year um, and into the beginning of, of 2022. Um, and those will be ultimately archived at the Scottish Oral History Centre um, at, at Strathclyde University. Um, what I'd like to do today um, it is is hopefully um play play a, a couple of extracts in, in the time um available which might give rise to hopefully some discussion points um for for later but what i wanted to, to draw what i was trying to to draw on um in in some of this research and what i am trying to draw on in some of this research um was um other research which has been conducted with people as as they live through events um and and their immediate aftermath um such as uh the work on the September 11th uh, narrative and memory project um, and Mary Marshall Clark's uh, writing on that, which looks at the capacity of oral history to, to support the, the, the sort of active process of historical remembrance at its earliest stages. Um, and 
the process and, and to support the process of um, meaning making about um, events for those who are, who are living through um, events, creating that 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 crucial link, as as Mary Marshall Clark describes it, between um, our our past and our future, and and how we interpret and read that um, in the future. Something I think oral history is is uniquely um, positioned uh, to to do. Um, so, as I say, what the the group within my, my wider group of parents that I'm going to look at today are, are people who, um, who experience pregnancy and uh, pregnancy birth um, and sort of early maternity leave uh, in in lockdown. The exam the, the extracts that I'm going to, to play um, today all come from people who um, were pregnant or gave birth in the very early stages of, of lockdown. Um, mostly in sort of April in April 2020 actually I think all of the extracts um, I'm going to play come from that and I, one of the, the things I will explore in this research when I've conducted the follow-up interviews as well as the impact of the passage of time on how um, parents reflect on on their experiences of of this uh, of this time and the differences in experiencing pregnancy and, and birth at later stages um, in the pandemic um, as well. But for, for now, I'm going to reflect on, on these um, early ones. Um, so I, I think something that, that came out of um, a lot of my interviews with, with pregnant um, women um, was a kind of sense of of isolation and a feeling of, of doing it alone um, in, uh, I think, particularly amongst uh, parents who, who had children um, already um, and who had experienced the pregnancy in, in, a, in a quite different um, way and that often partners couldn't attend um, scans and appointments or uh, or th they couldn't have um, birth partners come 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 to these things and and my interviewees often reported feeling emotional and, and upset about about these things this extract here comes from uh, a mother who uh, actually she gave birth in June 2020. I could tell a lie about the April statistic, but was pregnant at the early stages in the early stages of lockdown with with her first child, and and this is her um, discussing the realization um, in in March that that her partner wouldn't be able to come to her 20 week scan. Um, hopefully I've pressed. I'm just going to come out of my slides because I don't think I've pressed share sound, so uh, I'll come in a bit like a jack in the box. Uh, uh, oh, I, I did do it. Uh, here we go. That was the bit, that was the, the wake up call for me, I think, as to how severe this lockdown was actually going to be. Because I sat in um, Marks and Spencer's car park the day before and got a call from the hospital to say that my husband couldn't come to the 20 week scan. And I just remember bursting into tears. And prior to my pregnancy, I don't think I was overly emotional, but that would that was the wake up call for me where I thought this is really serious um, and to be told that your husband couldn't come to your 20 week scan was a bit of bit of a shock to be honest um, so on that basis we then made the call that we wouldn't find out the sex of the baby and, and what not so um, going to that 20 week scan was a little bit daunting um, but you know everyone, every woman in the room was in the same situation so I guess there's a like-mindedness there that you're looking at other women who are in the same situation as you. And I, and I think within I think in that, in that extract within those feelings of isolation, there's a, a sense of trying to pursue um, a, a like-mindedness and a, a sort of collective uh, identity that that perhaps um, pregnant women would have been able to do um, prior to the the pandemic, and and the ways that women seek to to do that is something that I'm, I'm looking to explore as as part of the research. Um, this uh, extract comes from um, a mother who was experiencing her second pregnancy and gave birth um, in mid-April uh, 2020. Uh, again, uh, discusses feelings of isolation of not being able to involve um, her partner um, in uh, in the experience, but but also the sort of added pressures of um, having to to find childcare um, for another child. So I'll play that just now. It was all just. Yeah, there was. I was in one appointment with a midwife just in floods of tears because the, they'd shut down the whole maternity ward essentially. And at that point, I didn't even know if Kevin was going to be able to come in with me when I went into labour. Mm. Um, so it was all a bit. Well, it, it's and it spoiled it really that last sort of run up. It wasn't the relaxing um, 
period of coming onto maternity leave and having a couple of weeks to get myself organised and calm and things. I didn't have that. Um, like I'd had the, the first time I'd had when I had Rowan. So it was. <laughs> it hasn't stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so what was that? So what was that like going into those last appointments on your own and doing doing that? For those it was it was really ho- it was really horrible because Kevin hadn't missed anything. He had been with me for every single appointment with Thorin and with Rowan. He was there with me for everything. Um, I think he sometimes felt like a spare part in the midwife through kind of going, "What the hell's he here for?" But it's his as much his baby as it was mine. Um, so it was important for us that he was that he was there, and I found it really upsetting having to drive to the hospital by myself I was finding driving quite uncomfortable by that point and then you had to go in a separate e- entrance into the hospital and they cleaned the banisters behind you with um, disinfectant and um, you were left sitting in the corridor until your appointment and it, it, I mean the midwives were still very welcoming and did everything they could to put you at ease but it was yeah it was really difficult um, um, to just do that by yourself. Yeah, so, so I think even even there with a, a sense of there's a positive treatment by by um, healthcare professionals um, and 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 feeling supported professionally, there's a kind of loss of that loss of, of personal support and isolation um, emerges there. Um, that th- this um, isolation, I think, um, it sort of intensified. In I uh, had a few cases in this particular case of this interviewee, where the the mother was was actually diagnosed with coronavirus immediately after labour, um, and and I think that that sense of isolation and and feeling emotional is in, intensified here um, in in this extract. Um, I stayed until the Friday evening, so it was just one day, but because it was quite complicated during the birth I had a temperature so um just normal temperature but because of that they had to test me for um for covid obviously because it's a symptom and um because of that then I got put I didn't get to go back to the maternity ward I got put on one of these red wards covid wards um so I was on my own there was nobody else on the ward like not one single patient on the ward just me and Millie in a room by ourselves for that sort of what felt like the longest 24 hours ever mm. um you know nobody would come near you don't you understand obviously nobody would come near us really without obviously the full pp and stuff so it was just kind of me by myself with her for the first 24 hours so it was really it was really daunting um yeah so so i think i think that the 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 impact of the passage of time will be interesting to reflect on in relation to this kind of experience, because I think reflected here is kind of the, the early fe- fear, even amongst healthcare professionals, but so sort of go, going near someone with with um, coronavirus, um, and um, at, at this point, um, healthcare professionals certainly in the UK were, weren't equipped with the necessary PPE to to do it. So that that's reflected um, in that testimony there. Um, we have else? One, we have one minute left to wrap it up. Perfect. That's great. I'll not. I'll not play the last couple of clips, but I'll just summarise briefly that the two of the one of the two of the last groups that I, that whose experiences I, I looked at were um, the experiences of uh, mothers and parents with with newborns in the early stages of of maternity leave, and I think um, out of that emerged often a, a sense of having missed out um, on on an experience they should have had, and words like spoiled and robbed and and stolen um, emerged. Um, quite quite a lot um, and I think um, in this in this extract here um, if you've got a chance to, to read it the, the lack of informal support which I think a lot of parents viewed as particularly important um, and I did also reflect on the experiences of, of fathers of this this early stage um, and and again this extract here which I'll leave up for for a few seconds um, is, is quite a positive reflection from from a father um, which um, will have perhaps interesting um, it will be interesting to reflect on in relation to discourses on 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 gender and, and employer and enjoyed being able to work work 
work from home um, and experience life life with a newborn in the way that he wouldn't otherwise um, have done. So so yeah, so so a range of themes I think have emerged from from these early interviews, which I'm now sifting through and and reflecting um, and reflecting upon, um, and um, will uh, continue to to examine and to relate to existing discourses on gender um, and employment and, and family life as I carry out the follow up interviews uh, later in the year and early next year. Thank you so very much to our three presenters. As we move into the question period, I again invite all members of the audience to either write your question into the chat or perhaps just to write your name into the chat so that I can then kind of call upon you that you can post your question kind of orally. And maybe as you're kind of formulating questions on your mind, something which I found really striking listening to these three fabulous presentations were the temporalities of family stories. In Rebecca's talk, we encountered the sacred time of the big meeting, the one meeting that your great grandmother went to once a year, the circular time of family time with this endless repetition of family chores, but then also the fluid temporalities we encounter of psychic time, the slippage between time worlds where the present can easily encounter kind of the future. In Georgia's presentation, I was struck with the storytelling we of your narrators. You interviewed your male respondents um, by themselves, but each remembered a certain conversational time where they had kind of debated with their partners the decision on whether or not to have a vasectomy. And then, of course, with Ellison's presentation, we encounter time suspended, times um, that came to a standstill where the world stood still and then kind of key life events happened in this period in your respondents' lives where time very much kind of um, moved differently. And so I would invite all the three panelists to maybe reflect a bit more on these temporalities that played out in these various sets of family stories you have been sharing. And feel free to just kind of dive in or kind of wave and I'll call upon you. Sure, I'll, I'll dive in. That, uh, the presence of time was something that I was, I was acutely aware of when conducting the interviews because memory did not, does, does not and did not happen in a linear fashion. It, it was sparked by, by, sometimes they would spark their own memory by talking about one thing and that would draw them back to another thing that might have happened 50 years prior before they were born. And, and it was really just a, an interweaving of, of one story leading to another to another. So, so I find that it, it, at least in the memory of family that it, um, that there was no linear pattern to, to the memories and the stories that were told. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, I can go. Uh... Yeah, I think the the idea of time is really interesting, especially I'm actually writing a book for an edited um, kind of collection at the minute or a chapter for an edited book at the minute um, that is about the idea of vasectomy as an everyday healthcare uh, thing, because obviously it is a singular event that is permanent in most cases. It can be reversed sometimes, um, but about this idea that men saw as the, the opposite side um, from the pill, which was obviously an ongoing everyday decision and like uh, process of contraception. And yeah, this idea that somehow the sex me despite being a one off thing is also a continuous thing and it's obviously continuous presence in a man's life that he is not fertile anymore. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something that I am trying to consider more, but I think the narrators were very interesting in how they situated a lot of them couldn't remember the year that they had their vasectomy for example but they would be able to situate it by their children's birth years and things like that so thank you very much georgia uh, yeah and i think i think I think certainly yeah, time was was really important to lots of aspects of of the interviews um, that that I've kind of done over the over the last year, and I, I think the a lot of the sentiment out of extracts like the ones I 
played um, today um, were, was quite often quite 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 overwhelmed and lots of references to being up, up, upset and emotional because of the sense of isolation. I think then as I moved through the interviews as, and, and the time that I carried out the interviews, I think also important, uh, very important in the last year. And I think coming into the spring, the, the sort of late spring and summer um, of last year as, as lockdown restrictions eased here and, and, and partners were able to go to, to scans and appointments again and, and go with uh, and, and women had more reassurances that they would be able to have someone with them um, at the birth. I think there's more positive um, feeling coming out of a lot of the interviews. And then I think as I moved into the, the autumn and winter, because I interviewed through to the end of February this year, um, coming into the autumn and winter as, as restrictions started to, to come in again, and particularly come December, January um, in the UK, I think there was a uh, Quite a bit of fear and uncertainty coming out of interviews about what might come based on what what had happened um, before. Um, so I think all of all of those things um, come out of those interviews, and I think uh, there'll be quite a few of those interviewees that I'd like to to follow up and 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 look at later. Hopefully, once we are once they're looking looking back at it um, as something that, that that isn't a fear of, of of happening again. We hope how they reflect on on the entirety of the experience, depending on the, the stage, um, the stage that they were at. And that, yeah, I think that will definitely be really interesting to reflect on. Thank you so much, Alison. And we do have another question from Cynthia Hammond, um, and I'm reading it from the chat. Thank you so much to all the presenters. I was very interested in the spatial aspect of the stories we heard about in Rebecca and Alison's papers, the departure from the factory, the journeys alone to the hospital for key tests and scans. I was wondering if there were any other spatial stories in play that emerged in the research, and if perhaps Georgia also found that there was a spatial aspect to the interviews she did, thinking perhaps of the clinic or hospital in which these procedures took place. I can oh, or um, yeah so yeah there definitely was because again this is another thing related to this I find it very interesting that men were seeing vasectomy as the um the counterpoint to uh, the pill in particular because obviously the pill is taken at home and you know your bathroom or your kitchen or whatever um whereas men were going to quite often to a hospital um, at this point, at the point that most of the men I interviewed were having their vasectomies, that it was under general anaesthetic. It was a procedure that you would have like in an operating theater and stuff. Now it doesn't need to be, but, um, and it didn't need to be then, but a lot of them were under general anaesthetic. So it was still um, a significant medical intervention, but a lot of them quite often didn't remember whether what hospital or clinic it was that they had their procedure at they sometimes didn't remember which doctor they spoke to whether they spoke to their gp or whether they went to a family planning clinic like i was really surprised by actually the lack of memory <laughs> around a lot of it and to me that part of that is um that they just didn't see it as a big deal it was like it wasn't a significant uh, event in their lives and it wasn't something that they situated within their memories as a key point so when I was asking oh and did you go and ask your GP for the vasectomy like who did you talk to how did the referral process work they're kind of like I don't remember I remember waiting outside the clinic room and you know that was about it um and I think that that's really interesting because they they don't have these spatial or temporal, as I said, they forget what years it was, they have to kind of count backwards and all that kind of stuff. And I find that very interesting in contrast to, for example, major life events um, that people usually can give you a more full memory of. So. Thank you very much, Georgia. And um, Alison, Rebecca, did you also want to reflect on the spatial aspects of your interview work? Your oral history research. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I can jump in. Um, yeah, I think yeah, that, that that was interesting. That that's something that's been interesting to come in. I think maybe partly come in because of the the part of the sense of isolation being because uh, particularly with with the interviews that, that I've played today that they came from the quite early stages and the uh, under the stay at home order when when certainly here that there was the instruction to to only 
go outside once a day for your one hour a day of, of exercise. So um, for, for some women, I think going out to a healthcare environment or to, to a hospital um, could, could sometimes be quite, quite frightening and quite quite overwhelming. And, and sometimes um, I, I have some interviewees who, who reflected on um, a, a sort of feeling of, of being overwhelmed because because they hadn't been out, out of the house or, or into an environment like that for for some time and a lot of their pregnancy appointments had happened remotely and um i've i, I did i do remember distinctly one interviewee actually becoming quite quite upset when talking about she was talking about a a phone appointment quite late on in her pregnancy um uh, spring 2020 i think um and that she had been told that the appointment would be a face-to-face -face physical appointment um, and then later on because of a, a change to guidance on, on the day of the appointment she was told it would be a remote appointment instead uh, and she said she'd built her day around this and being able to see another person and had questions that she wanted to ask and that, and that doing it remotely wasn't um, qu quite the same so so I think that the, 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 for the, the place and the space perhaps almost became more important because of the restrictions that on on movement that, that that women had elsewhere um in their lives um so uh, yes i think that's what that's what kind of comes to mind to me that that interview when when looking at that question thank you Alison and rebecca yes the 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 spatial aspect was in, incredibly important to the stories that were told uh especially with sense memory and the question of place is is one particular that I'm that I'm interested in who has control over the narrative of place because both both places I'm conducting my research is, is are, are planned villages and these villages were, were made specifically to support the mills in question so when those mills shut down there is a question of well, what are these places now and for my own family it is very hard for them to, to even go through the very small town of Bremerton without pointing out the bank that used to be the family home that everybody had had lunch in and had dinner in. And, and, and then there is only a smokestack now of the factory that a majority of the town, including our my great uncles and my great great grandfather uh, all worked in um, as well as female members of the family. There was also a very big push to, to save the, the mill. And most people in the family just assumed that everyone was in agreement that uh, they should all rally and go to the courts and, and petition. And yet there were some members of the family who had no interest in, in, in keeping it up. Their, their, their perspective was to tear it down. And so that sort of created a fissure in the family as well as, as to the importance of buildings and spaces and in this small town that's been the same for almost 100 years and is now growing and changing and now it's 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 a college town whereas before there there was no alcohol now all the places that people used to live are little bars and restaurants and and uh everything to support the college community there so so that is a very large aspect of the research um in in how it affects the people left behind Thank you, Rebecca. We have another question from Yvonne McFadden. Um, really interesting presentations. Alison and Georgia, thinking about men's relationship to your topics, did you find men wanted to tell their story or felt the story was theirs to tell in relation to contraception, pregnancy, and childcare? Um, I can, I can come in on that um, if you like and I, th I think I think maybe uh, for me I think I, I, I did interview um, quite a few men um, uh, and and um, partners of, of pregnant women and partners uh, and, and men who had um, newborns in the early stages of lockdown I think mostly in relation to um, their experiences after the birth and I think from from that uh, that is something they were quite uh, quite forthcoming and talking about and um, as they often quite positive um, I think from the interviewees that I spoke to about uh, particularly if they were working at home and being able to spend time um, with a child I think that was a bit different because I, I spoke I spoke to fewer of but but I think two at least um, men who had whose um, partners were 
were pregnant but hadn't yet given birth and I think fr from that that was something I think that they did feel more excluded particularly in those early stages when when um, men were unable to to go to appointments and, and go to hospitals and weren't able to sort of be a, a part of it and I had I think also in my interviews with with women descriptions of um, men being told important um, information um, on the phone from inside a hospital or um, relayed in a car in a car park after the hospital and I think uh, after being in, in an appointment um, so, I, so I think that part of the process was something that, that men not that they weren't willing to speak about it but felt maybe they didn't have as much to, to say about it due to, to, to less involvement than um, they might previously have, have had I think. Yeah, um, I think from mine, I find it really interesting that um, men did tend to talk in we terms about them and their partner at the time. Um, as I say, like several of them did get divorced afterwards and were with different partners, but they would still always talk about we with them and their their partner at the time when they had a vasectomy and quite a lot of them would say at different points oh you should you should ask my wife or you know I could go and get my wife in or you know things like that um and I think we're used to the idea that they didn't have that this wasn't their story or that this um was at the very least their story as a couple and they weren't used to this kind of idea of telling their story by themselves and things like that so um yeah it was quite interesting the men i interviewed were quite happy to talk about it but quite often didn't really know how to talk about it i think they didn't have that um even thinking about pregnancy and stuff like women tend to have their birth story and how they tell the birth story or how they tell the you know their experiences of contraception and stuff that idea of rehearsal and everything whereas men that I interviewed anyway, just didn't have these kind of um, pre-prepared narratives. And there was a lot of jumping around and a lot of kind of discomposure and stuff like that. So I found that quite interesting that they were happy to tell them that they weren't used to telling them. Thank you very much. We have a question from Lauren Laframboise um, to actually the entire panel. Um, as Lauren writes, I'm wondering if you interviewed across race and class. Oops, they, they are. And whether or not those intersections affected family experiences and decision making in your areas of research. Can I jump in first? <laughs> I so mine were all white, um, which is something I tried to find non-white men who had vasectomies but the demographic of people who were getting vasectomies at that point in Britain was extremely white so it's kind of narrowed down by the, the group that I was targeting um, but they were cross-class so I had some people of a very upper middle class background and some of very working class backgrounds um, and it was quite interesting in that um, at the time that they were getting vasectomies, vasectomies were seen as more of a middle class thing. They're still seen as a little bit more middle class. It's typically educated kind of middle class white men who get them. Um, but the working class men I spoke to were more willing to talk to their friends and families about it. And a lot of them talked about, there was one who was, I think, an engineer or a mechanic, but he talked about in the workshop, all the lads would just talk about stuff and they all knew that he'd had a vasectomy and they would make jokes about it but then a whole bunch of them went and had vasectomies in the next couple of years and you know the fact that this was very widely openly spoken about whereas the more middle class people tended to be more reserved about it and not share it with anyone beyond their partner their doctor and um, possibly some immediate family um, but they certainly wouldn't have told the people at work which I think is also to do with workplaces and workplace environments among working class versus no class professions and stuff um but yeah it's definitely something that seems to have affected the narratives and how comfortable they were within their community sharing that information thank you and rebecca allison if you want to reflect on this interviewing across class and gender 
Hey, um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm getting messages to say my internet is unstable, so hopefully I'm coming across okay. Um, but yeah, but yes, I did. I think I think probably not not, not as widely as I, I would have liked, but I did interview. Um, quite a few people from ethnic minority backgrounds and from different class backgrounds and and specifically in relation to this um the talk that i did today um i spoke to oh i think i might have frozen um but i'll i'll keep i'll keep going um i, I spoke to two um two pregnant women from ethnic minority backgrounds can anybody still hear me yes we can hear you But Alison, you can turn off your video. Oh, that you, can still, you can still hear me. Everybody's frozen on my screen, so I wasn't sure if you could. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, I'll try that. Um, I think I'm experiencing. We may just kind of wait until kind of Alison comes back to join oh, us. Right. So, so, okay, I, I think I might be back. <laughs> yes, we can hear you now again. Oh, no. Okay, yes. Hopefully what I have to say is worth, is worth hearing after after all of this. Um, but I think the one one thing that came out um, that, that was significant from speaking to, to people, the pregnant women from ethnic minority backgrounds um, was um, I think in the early stages of lockdown, so of greater fear of the, the virus because there, there was a lot going about, about in the media then about um, greater sort of impact um, on people from ethnic minority backgrounds that the virus affected those, that, those groups of people worse and I think that was something that was a, an accentuated fear for, for the, the two pregnant women that, that I interviewed. Um, and also something that came out of one of those interviews was um, a family dynamic in that one interviewee said that um, her, in, she expected in her first pregnancy that her mother would have travelled over from India and, and stayed with her for a long period of time. And that was something that she wasn't able to do um, because of this and and I felt that was probably a particularly uh, came came from her cultural background um, and I'll stop talking now in the hope that you all got something from that. Thank you Alison. I realize we're at 11 o'clock but I just wanted to give Rebecca a chance to chime in if she so wanted. Sure. Uh, the Of course with the nature of this particular paper uh, being family we we were all from the same well uh, my my mother and aunt are from the same social class. I think technically I was raised middle class, but um, and and of course the same race as well. However, uh, overall in my research, I do plan to to expand it to uh, to different races there, especially in the American South. Uh, African Americans had a particularly hard time, and just integrating into uh, the textile industry, and then of course once they were fully integrated, it it was it was shut down. So I, I do hope to feature a lot of their stories within my research. It's just something that hasn't occurred yet. And by nature, uh, it is working class studies. However, one narrative that kept coming up just from uh, my aunt and my mother is even though they their their grandparents started at the at the bottom of the mill uh, as teenagers, my great grandfather did work his way up. As, as one of the supervisors of the mill and was close friends with the owner of the mill. So therefore, I, I don't know if he technically was on a different uh, class structure to other workers of the mill because he was in a managerial position. Not that that helped him in the end, he still lost his home when the mill was sold, but, but he did have a different um, structure to the rest of the community. Thank you. If we had been able to meet in person, this conversation would now spill over into the coffee break. There are two more wonderful questions by Arthur McIver and Pusha Chatterjee, which we can't quite get to, but I do hope you will have a chance to connect with the presenters, maybe in one of the breakout rooms kind of later on. Please join me, everybody, in giving one more round of applause to our speakers this late morning. Such a great panel. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for your great moderating and thanks to all the speakers, another fantastic panel, fantastic questions. Uh, once again, we have, um, well, I guess it's a 12 minute uh, pause here and you're, you're invited to 
rejoin a breakout room if there's somebody specific you'd like to chat with and you can find them one on one there or visit the research creation breakout room for the screenings or if you need to just step away from the computer I think we can all understand that but we will be coming back together in 12 minutes for session three story identity and selfhood look forward to seeing you all then thanks again Barbara And I like that your cat has joined you. Um, yes, she <laughs> is extremely intrusive. I gave a presentation at a conference about a week and a half ago and she was swatting at my face as I was talking. <laughs> I feel like the Zoom era has just made me give up a certain like dedication to professionalism. Look, there's another one. I love this. I, I'm all in favor of any kind of pet Zoom bombing meetings. I, I just love it. I like also that often all you can see are the ears or the tail. Oh yeah, no, she will like, she will put her butt right into the screen. That like really I've got one here as well, too. Oh my God, <laughs> so great. Zoom, Zoom bombed my paper. <laughs> it, was, it really worked. I thought it went extremely well with your paper. I was glad because he, he was like pawing at my pen the whole time and like trying to get the paper down. And so I was <sighs> glad that we finally got up and I could just move him again. Well, I, you know, they, they <clears throat> must, now that this has been going on for a couple hours, they must be getting very annoyed that <laughs> your full like, attention hello. isn't focused on them. <laughs> yes. But my mind was here at the very beginning, but she's gone off now in a half. She's over. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, we've got about one minute left. <laughs> so I'm going to send, I like that nervous giggle. Oh, that was for, oh, there's another kitty. Can I see it, Arthur? Oh, it's beauty. Really My cat's quite, cat. um, she's quite vocal. Yes. So quite often she's in the background of my lectures and I eventually have to give up and just, she became the star of some of my lectures because she sits behind me on the back of the chair and oh god I love it just part of work from home isn't it I'll miss it I've got to say when we go back I like having the proximity with the pets I think they will really have a rough time actually yes yeah I do too okay um I'm just gonna send a message to anyone who's in the breakout rooms Looks like pretty much people are back here. Okay, so it's 11.15, so um, very happy to welcome everybody back to the third session of the first day of the CODES SOHC Summer Institute. And our next uh, panel is titled Story, Identity, and Selfhood, and our moderator is Eleni. So I'm going to give you the floor, Eleni. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to see you all here. My name is Eleni Polykronakos, and uh, I'm an affiliate of the of uh, CODES at Concordia. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the panel, Story, Identity and Selfhood. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing our first presenter, um, Ali Williamson, who is a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and uh, funded by the Scottish Graduate School of Arts and Humanities. Her PhD is an oral history project with Scottish lesbians born before 1980. Ali is currently working with SGSAH on their equalities, diversities and inclusion strategies on a part-time basis. Post PhD, she would like to use her research skills in a non-academic setting hopefully still in the beautiful city of Edinburgh. So uh, go ahead, Ali. And oh, I'd just like to remind everyone, feel free to um, add your questions to the chat as we go along. Thank you. Ali, I, I give it over to you. And um, thanks, Eleni, for that intro. Um, I really appreciate it. And sorry that I don't have a fabulous presentation, but that is beyond my skills. So you'll just have to um, hear me for, for 10 minutes. So. Um, 
I just want to say also how lovely it is to connect with you all um, virtually. Um, I wasn't able to make it to the earlier presentations, but I'm really excited um, for tomorrow. It looks like there are some really interesting um, and thought-provoking uh, presentations. I'd also like to thank you for tuning in and hearing me speak. Um, so this we talk is a methodology reflection on the 21 interviews I've recorded this past year remotely um, with Scottish lesbians born before 1980. Um, so over a year ago, I'd immersed myself in oral history theory and methodology and was raring to start my fieldwork when, plot twist, the global pandemic happened. Um, and I reluctantly at the time came to realise that I would not be able to do my research as I had planned. In other words, I would not be able to conduct in-person interviews, um, which, as you know, has largely been the assumed way in which oral history happens. Um, and my impression is that despite COVID, there continues to be scepticism around remote interviewing. Um, anecdotally, I've observed oral historians since the pandemic commenting that remote interviews lack the substance of in-person interviews because of the difficulty of building rapport remotely. Um, and I completely sympathise with this perspective because that is exactly how I felt before I started doing uh, remote interviews. Um, despite being an oral history novice before my PhD, um, all the literature I had read suggested that the key to recording rich personal testimonies was trust and goodwill between narrator and researcher. Um, how would this be possible, I asked myself, without meeting someone face to face? Um, and I really only started doing remote interviews because it was the only option I had if I wanted to continue my field work. Um, and it was an, an oral history project um, at its heart. There is very limited um, archival evidence relating to Scottish lesbian lives. And I also really felt that kind of political need to um, uh, record women's own voices um, and for that to go on the record. Um, I'm hoping to, to record, to archive, excuse me, the interviews with the, um, at the University of Edinburgh. And I think what will be their first LGBTQ sort of oral history collection. Um, but I digress. Um, so, so I started doing remote interviews because out of, you know, desperation really. Um, and to my surprise, I've had a really positive experience of remote interviewing. Um, and most importantly, have felt like the interviews have been rich encounters. Um, Apart from the fact they've had many additional benefits in terms of reduced labour, i.e. they're really easy to set up and you don't have to travel, um, benefits in terms of increased flexibility, i.e. actually being able to conduct fieldwork during a global pandemic. Um, and therefore, my feeling is that looking to the future in the oral history community, I think remote interviewing could be a really valuable tool in our arsenal. Um, so I used Zoom for my remote interviews um, and a framework for my positive experience, I think, is that sociologists who have researched differences between in-person and remote interviewing have found remote video call interviews to be as popular and as successful as in-person interviews. Um, the research suggests this is a mixture of quite practical reasons, like it's often much easier for folk to arrange a video call in their busy schedules than it is to travel to a different location, but also more psychological factors like being more in control of your space and conceivably anonymity as well when you're sitting at home in front of your laptop as opposed to in a stranger's office, even if they do have the legitimacy of being affiliated to a university. Um, I suppose it is quite bizarre, you know, you are recording sometimes quite intimate, like personally intimate interviews with people. And yet all you're seeing is like their sort of neck onwards. Um, but but it, yeah. Um, so in some, I had a very positive experience of remote interviewing. 
Um, and I believe my narrators did too, based on their ease with the medium, the richness of the testimonies. Um, and for example, the frequent laughter that I found punctuated the transcripts. I actually had a joint interview where two of my narrators came with a bottle of wine and a board of nibbles, um, reflecting, I think, their ease with their remote interview. Um, yeah. Um, so who were my narrators? Apart from the fact that all my narrators were Scottish lesbians born before 1980, um, I would say that my project attracted a very specific demographic of women. The way I would characterize them is that they were all white um, and they were employed in very white collar professions like teachers, um, doctors. Um, they've mostly had urban experiences. In other words, they've grown up and lived in Scotland's cities. Although maybe a quarter of my narrators grew up or lived in more rural areas and could comment on that. Um, and the majority of my narrators were born in the 60s and 70s. I find it quite difficult um, to recruit narrators born before 1959. I think, I think only four um, were born before that date. Um, and what were they like? Um, I've interviewed 21 women, as I said, and what has really struck me has been what wonderful storytellers they've overwhelmingly been. Um, if I had to characterize my narrators in a single word, I would say confident. Um, my interviews were semi-structured and I mostly hadn't met my narrators before the encounter itself. But strikingly, in so many of my interviews, my narrators really took the lead or narrative authority, I felt. And I really didn't end up asking that many questions in some cases. Um, I had the impression they had a story or a set of stories to tell, and that was why they had responded to my project. When I noticed this, I initially thought of the seminal lesbian oral history monograph, Boots of Leather, Leather Slippers of Gold, and the author's argument that their New York working class lesbian narrators were such exquisite storytellers because of the necessity in a heteronormative society of continually coming out to various audiences and therefore becoming very practiced at it. While there is certainly truth in this interpretation, I had a really thought provoking supervision with one of my supervisors, a sociologist, not an oral historian, who suggested that this ease with telling one story might also reflect competence. I don't think it's incidental, as I previously mentioned, that my narrators were professional women used perhaps to owning space in their various vocations. I have wondered whether their confidence in our interviews, so much sometimes that I could barely get a word in edgeways, um, reflects this. Um, I think in some ways this was the most wonderful part of my interview experience, not only because I felt so much privilege in being able to hear these stories, um, but also because my narrators, more than I had hoped, structured the interview um, and shared what was important to them as opposed to following a script that I had created. And that meant a lot to me as much oral history theory has been about authenticity. So for example, my narrators kept returning to themes that I hadn't necessarily prioritized as much in my questionnaire, um, like motherhood or being in or out at work or in and out at work. Um, and I think I'm going to end there because that's my 10 minutes. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Ali. That was very interesting um, to hear uh, how um, interviews uh, happen in, in the time of pandemic. And um, I'd like to introduce the next presentation, um, which was created by um, three scholars. And unfortunately, one of them was not, uh, is not able to be present with us today um, due to unforeseen circumstances. Um, that's Nancy Ribello, but I'm going to go ahead and read um, everyone's bio uh, that was involved in this project. So first, uh, we'll, we have uh, on this uh, project Anna Scheftel, 
who's an associate professor of conflict studies at St. Paul University. She's an expert on oral history, Holocaust testimony, and memory of genocide. Her article, Talking and Not Talking About Violence, Challenges in Interviewing Survivors of Atrocity as Whole People, won the 2019 Oral History Association Article Award. She has a DPhil from the University of Oxford in Modern History, and she has worked with survivors of the Holocaust and conflicts in the former Yugoslavia. Nancy Rebello, who, as I said, cannot be with us today, teaches in the History Department at Dawson College in Montreal, Canada. She has worked on various public history projects, including Project 55, a historical audio tour of ethnic communities on Saint Laurent Boulevard aboard Bus 55, and a walking tour titled Memories of My Home, Memories of My Neighborhood, Cabot Square. These projects showcase the voices and memories of Montrealers, providing an intimate and untold history of the city's diverse communities and its neighborhoods. Given her interest in pedagogy, Rebello has also worked on several initiatives that promote student success within Dawson's social science program. And the third uh, participant in this project is Esther Andor, who is a commemoration and oral history coordinator at the Montreal Holocaust Museum, or MHM. She works with Holocaust survivors who share their stories with students and is also responsible for the museum's growing oral history collection of Holocaust survivor life stories. She organizes commemorations and other events that involve survivors too. Andor helped to create the museum's Holocaust Life Stories website and was involved in two virtual exhibits, Building New Lives, produced by the MHM for the Virtual Museum of Canada and Witnesses to History. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, that's the second presentation. And Witnesses to History, Keepers of Memory, a portrait exhibit to honor 30 survivor speakers of the museum. Um, so I give the floor over to your presentation. Uh, so just to let you know, I'm not turning my camera on because my internet is acting up and hopefully you can hear me properly if I don't have the camera on. Uh, I will start, uh, then Anna will take over and I will conclude. <laughs> So Refugee Boulevard that we're sh showcasing here um, gives the history, the stories of six war orphans, uh, two girls and four boys who arrived in Montreal in 1948 and who set about to rebuild their lives here uh, in, a pre in a then predominantly Jewish neighborhood, which we know today as the Plateau Montréal or the Myland. Uh, and before we go into the project, I would like to give you a little bit of, uh, of of a historical context. Uh, while the war ended in Europe in 1945, it did not mean a return to normalcy for most uh, survivors. Uh, for many, it basically marked a time of new challenges and new struggles because when they were liberated, many of them found themselves totally alone without a home to which to return to, without a family, without friends or without a community. Uh, the horrors of the Holocaust at the time in 45 were not so widely known as they are now, and anti-Semitism was still strong in Europe. So many of these Jews, after having lost everything in the Holocaust, believed that the, <clears throat> the only way to start, to really start a new life, was to leave Europe behind and settle outside. Uh, and this was really voiced by several of our interviewees. One of them said, the only goal that I had was to get out of Europe, but this was echoed in, in other interviews as well. Uh, most countries, however, heavily restricted Jewish immigration, and while a number of Jews, Jewish communities were established here in Canada at the turn of the century, in the 1930s and the 1940s, the, <clears throat> the immigration policy could be characterized by the famous saying, none is too many. So basically, very few Jews could come in here during the war and right after. Uh, 
Part of the reasons were partly anti-Semitism and partly also the belief that the survivors were not quite right, that they were somehow broken. So this country did not want much of them. And it wasn't until the late 1940s when the Jewish community, having lobbied for years, uh, finally managed to get approval uh, for survivors to settle. And they came through a, a variety of labor schemes. Uh, for example, the Furrier scheme, scheme uh, or domestic laborers or um, seamstresses. They came also through family sponsorship, those who had family here already, and uh, the uh, third kind of large program was the War Orphans Project, which uh, sought to bring over to Canada about a thousand war orphans under the age of 18. Uh, and in the post-war period, once uh, Jewish survivors uh, started coming, Montreal became the ho home to the world's third largest community of survivors outside of Europe. Uh, in the uh, <clears throat> war orphan scheme, finally, they didn't manage to bring quite a thousand uh, orphans. They bought about uh, 760 boys and 350 girls. And um, most, many of them, more than half of them, over 500, uh, settled in Montreal. Uh, and the relationships and the friendships and the support network that they formed in these first few years of, of their life here were really key. That's what we found in the interviews. We're really key in helping these orphan survivors move past what they experienced in Europe, move past their Holocaust experience and, and truly rebuild their lives. Of course, without really forgetting what had happened to them. And I will uh, give the floor over to Anna now. Thank you, Esther. Um, so the project builds on um, over a decade of collaborative research between Stacey Zimbricki, um, uh, who was the, the PI on the grant, myself, this group of local Holocaust survivors who we interviewed, the Montreal Holocaust Museum through Esther. Um, and it started initially in the Montreal Life Stories project that took place at Codes at Concordia. Um, so we started the project by revisiting um, our Montreal Life Stories interviews, and then we reached out to these survivors that we'd had these long-term relationships with to conduct new multi-session interviews in, at, in their homes, but also in situ in the neighborhoods where they had first settled. And these are neighborhoods they don't live in anymore. So it was really bringing them back to the space that they remembered from the late 1940s and early 50s. And so the project creatively mixes the stories shared um, um, in both projects to offer an effective physical experience that invites participants to share this embodied and narrative journey that accentuates, accentuates particular aspects of movement, arrival, and spaces of coherence and dislocation in that process. And a collaborative approach was at the heart of our project's ethos. Members of our team worked with each other to make sure decisions collectively and through consultation. But more importantly, we partnered with our survivors to shape and sort of choreograph the project's narrative around the post-war stories and the neighborhood sites that were important to them. So the project wasn't just collaborative, but it also entailed co-authorship with survivors, particularly, and I'll give you an example, with our narrator, Fischl Goldig. Um, we went back and forth on the script with him repeatedly before we recorded it so that it would be something that both served our purposes in terms of narration, um, but it also gave him the space to relate these overall themes that we were asking him to talk about to his own experiences. And this approach resulted in an audio tour that is led exclusively by survivors themselves. So there's, the, there's no narrator that's like the distant objective voice. It's a survivor who's talking to you and introducing you to the stories of other survivors. Their voices are the only ones that participants hear. Um, and uh, um, I wanna play a little clip from Fischl's intro to the tour that shows you this, the way he weaves his personal narrative into his narration. And I just realized I didn't check, I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a sec. I didn't check that I was connected to the audio. I am, okay. Um, so let me know if you don't hear this. Difficult. I was a survivor of the Holocaust, an immigrant in a new country who spoke neither English nor French. I moved into this neighborhood with my mother, who worked as a dress finisher, and my father, who worked in a rubber factory. Although I was big and strong and wanted to get a job to help out, my father would not hear of it. 
Instead, I was sent to study at Yeshiva Merkaz HaTorah High School. In the years following World War II, this area was a vibrant hub of Jewish life. This audio tour transports you back to that time through the stories of six Holocaust survivors who also arrived in 1948 and quickly set about remaking their lives here. Jewish Congress also gave us three passes. I didn't realize I was going to start playing right away. So official, um, also I should say, just has just about the greatest voice I have ever heard. Um, and it's such a pleasure listening to his narration. So we, um, we think the project is innovative because this collaborative immersive structure and also because it tells these little known stories of survivors early lives in the neighborhood in this really situated way. Uh, the methodology led us to arrive at new understandings about survivors' lives during and beyond the Holocaust. So survivors, of course, are well known and respected in the Jewish community and in Canadian society, but they're often seen very one-dimensionally um, as symbols of suffering. Refugee Boulevard helps listeners connect with their complex, um, oops, sorry, uh, uh, complex humanity, portraying them as whole people with difficult but also mundane experiences which include playing sports, relishing food, dating, and dancing. Relationships and a sense of community among and between groups of survivors, in this case, three Hungarian war orphans, emerge as a key way of moving forward from the losses they experienced. We avoid the individualizing tendency of oral history. Um, and here I wanna play another clip, uh, the one that started before, in which Tommy Strasser describes his, the first time he went into the Young Men's Hebrew Association, YMHA, uh, which is one of the first stops on the tour in his early days in Montreal. Jewish Congress also gave us free passes to the YMHA on Mont Royal, Corner Park Avenue. Just a hop, skip and a jump away. I was told that there was a club of Hungarian arrivals. Why don't I go and join them, you know, meet them? And coincidentally, it was a very interesting uh, happening during the Holocaust. I met a uh, guy that I was together with in a forced labor camp. We were together till liberation, actually, in the ghetto in Budapest. When we got liberated, we said goodbye to each other, figuring we'll never see each other again. I go into the uh, YMHA the very first time. I open the door, who do I see? My dear friend, George. I was flabbergasted, I, you know, like I, I burst out in tears actually, you know, like it says, so did he for that matter. And we embraced, you know, like lost brothers, which we were really. And then we reminisced, of course, you know. It was quite a, uh, a joyful uh, meeting Naturally, we became very, very close again. So the, the audio tour conveys experiences that are simultaneously individual, but also collective with survival, including Sorry, that Sorry, and a two minute warning. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm going to then get my thing to play one more clip about this notion of, of how we record people reestablishing their lives and finding happiness in a new country. And this is from Musha Schwartz. Then I met my husband, then I met some other boys in between, but uh, I met my husband when we got married in 1915, December. The people, I, I lived this like family and uh, made some sandwiches. The rabbi, I don't think, wanted to charge. His wife wanted to kill him for it. She didn't like that idea that he was so charitable there. Uh, but there were just, I don't know, 20 people. But there was a wedding and a hoopah and then and, uh, and a lehaim. And uh, gradually things began to sound normal enough that I wanted to have my own place, put a nail in and hang a picture. And as soon as we could afford the food anyhow, we wanted to have a baby. Okay, so we believe the project um, provides both students and um, people interested in the Holocaust uh, this humanizing portrait of, of um, this particular history that also relates to contemporary issues around multiculturalism, immigration, and human rights. 
Because the tour has been used in classrooms throughout Canada and the US and because of COVID-19, we also thought it was important um, to make sure that it be available to people who can't come down to the neighborhood to walk it themselves. Um, and so in the past year, uh, members of our team worked with a Concordia University Public I History intern, Jasmine Cardillo, and created a virtual version of the tour using Google Street View. Um, and we're continuing to build on this web storyteller section of our website, which serves as a platform for the Holocaust Museum as well to keep sharing these lesser known stories. And Esther, if you want to conclude, I'll send it. Uh, I don't know if we have any time left to conclude. Cynthia or you can, Elaine? You, you can take uh, a few. A okay, I'll just quickly quickly go through three, three points that I would like to make as a conclusion about why the project is special. Uh, the first one is very simple. It's very accessible because everybody can download the tour and they can do it on their own. They can do it with friends. They can do it in a class. So, uh, and because everybody downloads it, it doesn't create this usual problems that people can encounter with uh, uh, guided tours. The second is that, as Anna mentioned, we interviewed people not only in their homes, but in situ, and that really brought out stories. And because walking around the neighborhood helped them conjure up uh, emotions, uh, memories, uh, details that they didn't remember at home. So, uh, so that helped to make it much richer as a, as a storyline. And the third uh, um, that I would like to make, the third point is that uh, all of these people, uh, most of them are speakers at the museum. So most of them have been sharing their stories for decades. And because of that, they have a, a kind of like a rehearsed presentation of their Holocaust story. And what was interesting in this, pro in this uh, project is that they had to move beyond that to, to appreciate the importance of the post-war stories as well. And it wasn't an easy journey. We had to uh, we, we had to have several sessions, several interviews with them to explain why it was important. They still need to tell their, their Holocaust story, uh, even if they do it in a short capsule, but it still has to be there. But we think that they managed to move beyond and, and finally understand how important the story of being here, of, of the first experiences here is. And through these stories, we also managed to uh, find memories of informal spaces and stories that that only exist in their memories that that have no archival records and that's that's also great uh, you know that's a, that's an important addition to their story so um i'll stop here and, and we can elaborate if there are questions thank you thank you i would like to thank ali um as well as Anna, Nancy, and Esther for this wonderful panel. Um, yes, let, let's uh, give them a hand. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed both uh, discussions. I'd like to invite um, everyone to put your questions in the chat, or if you would like to, um, if you would like to uh, to voice your questions, uh, you can always just click on the raise hand. Um, uh, icon, which is if you click at the bottom of your screen, there's a little smiling face. And if you click on it, that's where the raise hand raise uh, hand um, option is located. Um, I'm just saying that because I forget each and every time. So I just want to remind people that that is an option. Um, so um, I'm just uh, looking at the chat here waiting for questions to come in. Um, and I see hands though. I yeah. see hands up. Gada Marus. Okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Gada has her hand up, so go ahead and okay. ask your question. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Uh, good. Good morning. Uh, this was a wonderful panel. Um, I'll, I'll be brief because I, other people will probably want to comment and ask questions. So um, first to the, uh, the ones who created Refugee Boulevard, it's more of a, a, a thank you and a comment um, than a question. I just wanted to offer you some feedback about how I used it recently in a course I was teaching. Uh, on migrations and mobility justice. And I assigned it 
uh, as required uh, reading or viewing, and it just blew the students away, many of whom live in these neighborhoods, right? And, and you know, the course has a much more contemporary uh, focus on refugees and, and more recent migrations. Um, forced or otherwise, but uh, it was so important to anchor it in that project and, and understand the local history. So it's just a phenomenal piece of work. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll be using it again and again in my teaching. Um, the, the quick question is for um, Alice. Um, about the, um, you, you mentioned a few times um, the, the idea of confidence, how the people you were speaking to were very confident. And I guess I'm just wondering if, I'm sure they are confident, but I wondered if another factor is playing in, in, in the sense that people um, perhaps really want uh, to tell their stories. So, you know, they to be asked uh, about this, um, you know, these experiences uh, and to have a, finally a forum to be able to sort of expand on things that are probably bouncing around their head. Um, so I just, yeah, I, it's just sort of a, uh, curious, uh, a point of curiosity more than anything. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, Gada. Um, if I've like um, understood your your question, your your point, um, something that I found deeply moving was how a lot of my narrators would say how um, like interested they were in, in my project and how important that a lot of my narrators really shared how important it was for them to to record not just their like individual story, but that of their community, because they're, you know, historically like lesbian history, lesbian identities, lesbian communities have been so marginalized and, and made invisible. And um, so I really had that sense and, you know, you know, that's what I wanted to do in the PhD. So it felt really wonderful to, you know, be able to connect in that way. Um, um, I will say though that, you know, um, I think I mentioned that I found it difficult to, to recruit narrators kind of who were maybe a bit older and um, and I, I was speaking to one of my narrators about this and she was saying how she tried to recruit some of her older friends for my project and they just been they were not interested at all so I think it's interesting I think it's also one of those things where I think the people who respond I think you know to your project maybe are are very committed and keen but I think it's also important to emphasize that I think there there were big sectors you know there was also there were also women who that was not kind of that was not a space where they wanted to share their story like completely like fair enough obviously if they've because of maybe their generation you know they've spent most of their life like in the closet for example and um, yeah I, I don't know if I've answered your question but sure, thank you. yeah you absolutely have thank you that's really thoughtful and interesting thank you Thank I see you. that there was a question for us, and I don't know if you saw it, is how we yes. chose the physical site for the audio yes. walk. Uh, it was kind of given by the stories that we were getting. It's, we really basically wanted to follow up on the first uh, spaces, both institutional and informal, formal and informal, that shaped the experience of, of, the, of the survivors coming. So they told us about the spaces and some of the spaces are so much only living in memory that we couldn't actually really uh, pinpoint where they were because memories uh, were conflicting and we heard three different addresses for the same place. <laughs> Anna, do you want to add anything? Sure, if I can give one little example because this is one of our favorites from the tour. Um, the survivors told us about a restaurant that was in somebody's apartment on Park Avenue called Haludi's. It was a, a Hungarian family that had immigrated a little bit before the survivors and they would serve Hungarian food and this is where everyone would gather after their work days. Um, and so, you know, it's funny because you write these, everyone, any oral historian who's written a grant application knows you write this thing and you say what you think you're going to find. Um, 
but you're you're just kind of pretending because you don't actually know till you listen. So there's stuff like you know we we knew the big institutions that we would that would be around the project, but we didn't know this stuff obviously. And in terms of the like situated nature of it, literally what we had to do because the survivors hadn't thought about this in years and they hadn't been to the neighborhood in years, is we would like one of them was mobility impaired. We put him into our friend's car. We, we started recording and we were like driving around the block until he could figure out which apartment it was. And then he would be calling his friends and, and confirming and they'd be talking about what it was called and whatever. Like it was a very um, sort of a improvisational process to just like do what we needed to do to figure out this, this stuff that is again, otherwise completely absent from the archives and from any other writing on the Holocaust that we know of. Thank you for those uh, questions and answers. A great discussion going on here. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I, I don't see any in the chat. Um, I see Cynthia and Rebecca have, have their hands up. Okay. Uh, how about Rebecca? Would you like to ask your question? Hi, yes, I was, it took me too long to, to type it. Um, great presentations. A uh, question for, for Alice, uh, with the disappearance of physical lesbian spaces like bars and, and, and bookshops, did you come across in your research in, in your oral history project on how these women were finding community without access to, to those physical spaces? Um, so yeah, that that was that was. Thank you very much for that question, Rebecca. That was a theme that really came up in my interviews. There was there was a lot of nostalgia for women's discos, and we we spoke a lot about that. Um, and I think, um, uh, so in terms of specific places, um, spaces, um, women's discos were were really important, and a lot and that a lot of my narrators spoke about. Um, not only did that provide community, but often, you know, they met their future wife there. <laughs> um, um, but, um, and yeah, and it was actually really interesting doing the um, interviews at the time of the pandemic, because obviously those spaces, the ones that still exist are, you know, not, um, um, you know, were not accessible <laughs> because we've all been at home. And, um, and and we just spoke a lot about that about you know you know going so for so many of my narrators you know they they only sort of began to have maybe the language to talk about their sexuality in adult life and and therefore you know like leaving home and 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 going to you know phoning like the lesbian helpline and being told about a woman's disco and and going to it was really um yeah it was so important I feel I've rambled and I don't know if I've answered your question, but um, that was one point <laughs> anyway. Thank you, Ali. That was a great answer. And um, I'm going to give Cynthia the chance to ask her question now. So go ahead, hey. Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you to all the presenters very much. Um, I guess I had like a little passing comment for Alice um, and then maybe a question for our second two presenters. And the comment for Alice is, I, I, so I feel your pain in terms of interviewing, trying to find um, older interviewees, because I'm doing a project right now that is seeking to interview people over 50 about their memories of Montreal. And uh, it, with the pandemic, it's been very difficult. And I just wonder though, if one of the reasons why I think there's the sort of access to technology issues, and perhaps it's also in the case of your interviewees, it's just not willing to uh, expose oneself um, to potential bias. But then I also think there may have been a generational shift between people born after 1980 and people born before, in that there's, there's a, we're living in an age of self-disclosure now, which wasn't necessarily the case cat. That was a cat intervention. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just wondering if, if that might be something that if you do get to talk to some people who were born before 1980, if you can ask them about their reasons why they are reluctant to participate, it would be so interesting if you can get the, 
if you can get to that maybe once uh, pandemic restrictions lift and some aspects of participating become easier and then my question was for um, esther and anna so i'm a huge fan of your project as well and i was really really lucky to come with you when it was in the the kind of live phase during the 2018 conference that was held at Montreal in Montreal on the Oral History Association. That was one of the standout oral history moments of my life. But you've really captured my um, curiosity, Esther, when you were making your closing remarks and you were talking about how working in place with the interviewees uh, brought up these stories about informal spaces that had no archival trace. So I was just wondering if there are, which of the spaces that you have included in the audio walk, which would those spaces be? Or were there some that couldn't make it into the audio walk and you just didn't have space for them? Well, the ones we did include were the Faludi restaurant that Anna okay. mentioned and the New World Club. And that's the place I mentioned that we don't even know where it was because people's <laughs> memories are different about it. Uh, Anna, were there any that didn't make it in? Um, I think those are the main ones in terms of spaces that were completely informal, but there's also a lot of more like, you know, like sh the Schrader store um, as a site that's really important to the survivors because Joe Schrader was really kind with them. Um, that's that's obviously, it's, a, it's an official space, but it's not one that is recognized as part of this history um, that came up again and again. Um, and the one four theaters. Oh, and the 48ers, yeah, that's yeah. another informal association. They would throw New Year's parties. They called themselves the 48ers because they arrived in 48. And this is mostly Hungarian um, Jews. And just yeah. such a, they, they, they come up with the best names, like the New World Club, the 48ers. Um, yeah, but what I was gonna, what, what I wanted to add is this business of the informal spaces to me is what's super special about the project, but it also combines with the social nature of it. So like one of the survivors would say the 48ers or Faludi's restaurant, and then we would go and ask the other ones and all of a sudden they haven't thought about this in 30 years and they'd say, oh yeah, Baludis actually it was called Friedman's and actually the, this was on the menu, you know? And so it was this, them bouncing ideas off of each other that was so important, I think, to capturing this. That's awesome, thank you both. Thank you. Are there any other questions that we've got about two minutes so we could squeeze in one more quick question if you wanna raise your hand? Um, well, I have one. <laughs> Go ahead, Cynthia. <laughs> I always have one more. But I okay, so so the last question for Anna and Esther. The photographs that you showed uh, that you have on your website are absolutely gorgeous, and it always strikes me as so incredible that people who came to Canada with nothing somehow had access to cameras. Do you know anything about how those photographs came to be? I do not. It is incredible too. I will say anecdotally, my, my father was a Holocaust survivor and he, he had photos from like being in detention that I, I have never understood where these photos came from and that he had with him in Canada. So I don't have an answer to this question, but I agree that it's, and they're beautiful photographs, the ones you see on the website that mostly came from the survivors themselves. I have no idea, like they're dirt poor and somehow they have these beautiful photographs and I, I, don't know how, but I'm I, I, I wonder, Anna, if it has something to do with the fact that they lost so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we do interviews, we, we ask the, our interviewees to bring in any photographs and documents from before and during the war and a little bit after, and we scan them so that, that we have a photographic collection as well. Uh, and it's amazing how, like, how much some managed to save, especially those who are not deported, and then others have come with nothing. The, the virtual exhibit that uh, Ernie mentioned, uh, that our last virtual exhibit, uh, the survivor portrait, it has another name. Uh, and we asked the people, we, we went to people's homes, there's 30 people, uh, their home, and we said, can you show us an object or a photo or a document that's of importance to you? And it's interesting how many people said, no, I have nothing. No photo, no document. So I wonder if the fact that they couldn't save stuff didn't make them want more to, at any cost, to have some photos, some memories of, of their new life. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's exactly 12 o'clock. So I'd like to thank once again, all the presenters for their fascinating 
um, presentations, as well as all the participants who joined us on, on this first morning of the conference. Um, and uh, next up, we have a one hour lunch, which I'd like everyone to, uh, I'd like to invite everyone, please join us, grab some food or a tea or something, um, and uh, join one of the breakout rooms. Um, they'll be on for about an hour, so you can have discussions and ask the questions that you didn't get a chance to ask. Um, and so for now, I'll just close this panel and say goodbye and hope to see you in the coming days. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Eleni. Yes, Eleni did my job for me. That's great. Please, once you've had a break, you've, you've taken Sorry. something. No, 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 it was excellent. <laughs> I'm a broken record. Uh, yeah, once you get yourself something to eat, something to drink, feel free to come back and to have a smaller chat, ask people the questions that you didn't get to ask during the presentations and just basically to catch up. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Eleni. Thank you to the last two presenters. We'll see you in a few minutes.